You'll be famous up there, um, especially Greg with his beret. So <laughs> welcome, uh, Burgundy Masterclass 29 September 2021. So towards the end of the lockdown, we hope, um, and uh, back back to having some fun. So tonight discussing um, obviously Burgundy, uh, our family's ancestral home, and uh, arguably the most famous of the wine regions of the world, particularly as spoken by someone whose family comes from Burgundy. We hope no one here is from Bordeaux. They will have something else to say about that. Um, very quick background, those who know a little bit about us or want to know a little bit more. Um, obviously, we're a family winery. Um, my parents established it in 1998. Um, we go back a little bit further in winemaking in Australia, back to 1970 with my great aunt and uncle in the Yarra Valley. Um, but 1998 was our establishment at Ralston, um, which is in the Central Ranges region. So if you're looking, Central Ranges is Orange, Mudgy, Bathurst, Cowra. So the western flanks of the Great Dividing Range or the Blue Mountains. Um, nice ele elevation, nice cool climate, nice inland environment to be growing grapes. Um, we were the first producer there, and uh, which, which I guess we'll go through a little bit of why we took such a crazy step to pioneer a new location. A family originates in Burgundy. Uh, I know the surname is synonymous here in this country with uh, tyres. Um, but I, I guess the, the French have always been pretty good at tyres. Michelin is a great benchmark for that. Um, but it actually has a bit more of a, I guess, a grand or an older um, history. And it means, um, bow means obviously beautiful. Repair actually means hide away. So unfortunately, not good repairers. We were good at hiding away from something um, or a sanctuary. So been around in Burgundy a long time. Our family still resides there. They still live in the same home that we've had as a family for 900 years. Interestingly enough, we're still in contact. There's a very small family. Proliferation of daughters, uh, as demonstrated by me having two daughters, our family tree is mainly women. So there's only a couple of hundred of us actually in the world. Um, 2018, we won best wine in Australia. So we reasonable pedi small pedigree. Um, and, uh, but we're, uh, we're an on-premise wine. Um, we're not a bottle shop wine. So that's probably why... Um, so the grander, I guess, understanding of this is if you've come and visit us at the cellar door or you've been to a premise or venue which sells our wine. We're not in bottle, we're not in the Dan Murphy's or the, the vintage cellars or the like. Um, and uh, we're growing organically. That's the benefit of being a family business, especially now as the second generation is starting to join us or join we, us. I'm making, talking about myself in the third person, my sister on the left who looks after um, our direct business, which is so cellar door, wine club and the like, um, and our backend systems. My parents, myself, Annabelle, my oldest daughter, and Megan, my much smarter, better half. And um, it's giving us the ability to plan now a much further time horizon, which is very beneficial in the wine industry. We've still got a couple of thousand years to catch up on the French, but we're, we're accelerating towards that goal. Um, we are a French style producer. A lot of people don't understand what that term is and to be frank it, it's a bit glib um it does have uh, a little bit more substance behind it naturally being burgundian um this was always going to be our inspiration um but really what we're talking about is looking for elegance and balance in our wine making so we're looking for wines that match with food that they're not overweight they're not overly extracted um they're not uh, also under um, weight in terms of we're not uh, we're looking for flavor but we're also looking for things that are complementary that harken back to the wines of France um, age worthiness I think is a really important topic um, a lot of wines are engineered to be fantastic for three to five years these days maybe even shorter in Australia seeing as 95 percent of wine is drunk within 24 hours of purchase it's understandable the wine is not age what not designed for age anymore but by not making it age worthy, it means you miss those ultimate great peaks. And to be frank in it, my, I guess my, my view is great wines need to be great at 20 years. Um, if you can't make it out that long, particularly with your reds, you know, you're not, you know, you haven't really gotten there yet. Um, and that's a big, bold statement, but I think it's the real litmus test that wines can hold together through their tannin, through their acid, through the, the flavor. Um, and that comes from good vineyards which is where I guess the terroir becomes important. We've got limestone in it um, and we really are defined by that. We don't intervene a lot. We let the vintages speak. There is going to be variation, which means as you might see, when you look at our range, some you know, 
great vintages where we produce a lot of wines and some where we don't. Um, it might be smoke taint impacted, impacted like 2020, or it might be that there was too much rain or the wrong conditions for a variety. We declassify that those yeah. grapes and we sell them to third party wineries. And I'll go through that. But it gives us the ability to effectively have a wine that works within its environment, not against it. And that's a really important feature. We're not there. You can't fight your vintage conditions. Um, well, you can if you want to be a big commercial player. Um, we are much more sympathetic to our environment and also trying to improve it because there is a direct correlation between a healthy vineyard, a healthy, healthy vineyard biome and great wines. And that's been um, obviously an area of topic which we are pushing hard ourselves and it's increasingly being viewed as critical around the world. So that's sort of it. I know it captures a lot, but it sort of talks a little bit to most, most points. Um, I will break up this presentation with a bit of a chat about the wines. Um, I've learned from the early couple of these presentations, I talked about Burgundy and then right at the end, it talks about our wines and people were sitting there going, can I drink now? And I'm like, have you been sitting here for an hour and a half not drinking? So please drink through this. This is a, uh, an enjoyable experience, I hope. Um, it's not root canal work. Uh, the first wine um, is, is always a good one to start with. And I love talking about Chardonnay. And I, when I talk about like, why I love talking about Burgundy as a great um, masterclass, is isn't so much that I'm just going to focus on Burgundy, but it gives me the frame within which I can talk about our wine and make direct or interesting comparisons, say, with a classical or traditional Australian approach to wine. Um, and this is where, I guess, we kick off. And Chardonnay being... Um, Quite a famous variety. It's planted everywhere in Australia, but it's probably not planted in probably the same type of conditions as Burgundy. And I won't preempt the presentation, but Burgundy is reasonably cold. So whereas most of Australian vineyard regions, are, um, I'm just double checking, Greg, are you all right? I'll just make sure you got the right oh, one. Yeah, so good. We're just wondering which of the two Chardonnays to start with. Will. La Comtesse. Okay, start with La Comtesse. Okay. Perfect. We'll do. No, that's right. I can see that. I can see the page looking around. I'm like. God, I hope it's not Bordeaux tonight and I'm talking about Burgundy. <laughs> um, the, start with La Comtesse, and you've got La Comtesse there. Right. So the, the first, first real point is, is that most of Australia's viticultural regions are quite warm, much warmer than Burgundy. And what that does, and I, I can talk a little bit about it, is, is, that, is that when you're talking about ripeness, you're talking about three distinct types of ripeness in fruit. So the first one is, is sugar ripeness, so which relates to, I guess, the amount of acid and it's metabolized it's, as it's metabolized into sugar, the sugar then becomes alcohol. So important for getting that up to get the, you know, the low to mid percent alcohols. Um, the next is flavor, really important. It's a bit hard to really detect in fruit. You're looking for good flavor. It's, it don't, doesn't actually tell you exactly what the wine's going to taste like, but you're looking for um, ripe flavor tones. So in the fruit where maybe the bitterness has dropped or you're trying to retain the bitterness. Um, you can also test for the acidity, which helps in that environment too. And the third one is tannin ripeness, which isn't so important here, more so on the reds. Um, but what you're talking about here is, is in this warmer climate is grapes and vines have evolved sympathetically together in France over thousands of years of trial and error. There's a reason why varieties are where they are. There are now a lot of exceptions and Australia is proving that the, the vineyards and vines can work in, very different climates, but classically, the rootstocks, the way that these have been grafted, the evolution of the clones um, has been towards their native environment in this situation, cold climate. And what happens here is in a colder climate, um, you get a, a much slower um, ripening process. And that's important because with those ripening curves, the flavor curve tends to happen relatively steadily regardless of vintage. It's their sugar and acid curve that moves around a lot with temperature. So if the temperature is warmer, the sugar curve accelerates and you get a much faster ripening process. You lose, and, and, if it, and if it's colder, you, it goes obviously the other way. And where that's important is if, because you're wanting to pick fruit on flavor, hopefully, um, in a faster, warmer environment with that rising sugar at a much faster rate, it means that the acid's dropping at a much faster rate. And by the time you get to flavor ripeness, um, your acid has effectively metabolized majoritively out of the wine. And when we're talking about acid in fruit, we're normally talking malic acid. So think apples, pears, 
that type of acid. You've then got citric acid, obviously that's pretty obvious, lemons and the like. Um, tartaric acid, which is a more basic style of acid. You see that back in a bit more into your palate. I think I find it a little bit more bitter. And lactic acid is a wine related acid, to be honest. But what's important is, is as that malic acid goes, leaves the wine, and then you use what's called acid fermentation, which is where you create lactic acid. Sorry if it's a little bit complicated, but it's sort of important because this is where it all goes wrong or where we all went wrong with the ABCs was you had no malic acid left. You then put the wine through what's called malolactic fermentation or acid fermentation. Um, that process with malic acid makes them creamier, makes them richer, makes it expands the mouthfeel. So if there's no malic acid there, it goes after the citric acid and that's buttery. And it became, it became these incredibly buttery Australian Chardonnays. You probably remember them. They were, it wasn't a creaminess to them, it was a butteriness to them. And it was really just relating to the fact that it was just a little bit too warm. There wasn't the acid retained. So we were, that was just the case of where the vines were planted. Um, so that was step one, was, was a bit warm, a um, little bit too, the, the acid had, had, had fallen just a little bit too much. And um, so I turned into butter. And the next one was we used to not appreciate the nuances of oak. Um, and look, this is a very much still a developmental area, um, but effectively back um, in the 70s, you got, like you got to remember, we just moved out of being fortified producers to the world. Uh, we just lost the, 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 the UK to the EEC. So Australia was urgently having to change from producing sherry and, and the like for the English market to producing wine um, and trying to find new markets in particular. But um, because of that, you know, we didn't have a lot of fine wine experience. We had some guys like Max Schubert's and the like before. Um, and then in the 70s as well, you'd had quite a decent number that actually spent time now in Europe and around the world, like Cud Kays and Chester Osborne's and the like, who started going, we should be producing better quality wine. But the, 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 the knowledge base was still very formative. And this knowledge base is still moving. But what would happen was you'd order 50 barrels for your wine, 30 for your Shiraz, 20 for your Chardonnay. The net result was that you're using the same barrel for your red and your white wine. And what that happens and what's important to know is, is one, red barrels tend to be coarse grained and I'll talk about that in the next slide, but two, you tend to toast them. And we've talked about smoke taints, not so great when it's done to eucalypt, but when you burn oak, it releases a vanilla um, uh, aromatic profile. And um, it's really quite nice in a red wine, but it's overpowering in a white wine. And to understand that where toasting came from, toasting was effectively, you'd warm the stave, not burn it, you'd warm the stave up and you'd enable you to bend it. So I don't know if you've seen any of these building shows where they can do crazy things with wood when they put them in a steamer. So that was what toasting was. You put a warmth in there, you could then bend the staves, build a barrel. In 1970s at Robert Mondavi, they started realizing if you burnt them, it produce a lovely vanilla extract, Problem was that started getting into the wine. So you had these very, they were very vanilla, very oaky, very buttery Chardonnays. Um, yeah, ABC, the anything but Chardonnay became very strong in Australia and right into the 90s. Um, so what changed with Chardonnay? Um, one was appreciation that maybe cooler climate might be more appropriate to creating an old world style. So you started hearing about Tasmania um, or maybe parts of Victoria. Um, so it was just very formative kind of things at this stage, but, but, it, but it started driving this cool climate school that's become very dominant in Australia. Um, we then started realising that the oak, you know, what, 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 do the actual, what does the old world do? And you start looking at the barrels that they use in these various regions. First thing you realise is that a red wine barrel is very coarse grained um, and a white wine barrel is very fine grained. I don't know if you want to know, but... How you get that is effectively the slower growing the tree, the denser the wood. So, you know, the rings are closer, closer together. So you get a much finer grain um, and faster growing trees, oak trees give a coarser grain because obviously the rings are a bit further apart. Um, that depends on the side of the hill. That's all they do in, in France. Your white wine, white, your white, white oak, white wine oak is you harvest on the north side, the red wine on the south side, more sun, less sun. And um, what that means and the way that I think of it is, is, that oak um, being very coarse looks like corrugated iron. It reacts very much like corrugated iron. Wine gets into it. It really integrates and you get 
a large interaction, a large influence of oak into your wine. Perfect for red wine. White wine, not so much. So that was where the red wine barrels were problematic. Whereas fine or super fine looks and feels more like carpet. So when you put wine on, it's like when you pour it on the glass, you know, you have an accident and your wine falls on the floor. Um, you find that the wine bubbles up and doesn't really interact. It sort of it kisses the, I guess it kisses the, 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 the carpet or the oak in the situation, but it doesn't um, overwhelm. It doesn't you know, overly interact with the wine. Um, and that's really important because that comes to what's been more recent understandings. The next was obviously pulling back on the toasting. So moving back to light to maybe medium um, maximum. So that's been a big influence. Just trying to dial it back. Um, it's nice to get a little bit of tannin from the oak, but in reality, you don't want to over, you don't want too much tannin. Um, and uh, you definitely didn't want the vanilla, vanilla release. So that was the 2000s, 2010s, um, for really the last 10 years. You've had the evolution of uh, native winemaking, but just native yeasts, to be honest. And there's a reason. We got very science related with winemaking post-World War II and no more so than in Australia. We sterilized everything. And then we then go to the chemist and go, right, now I need to put some yeast in it. So we took away all variability, all the natural environment around and start and built it up from a laboratory, which was great for consistent quality. And it, look, to be frank, it creates nice wine. Nothing wrong with it. The problem is, especially with yeast, is that there are, I guess, there are two groups of yeast. And the way, um, got to be careful, I don't get too overly wrought here. Um, but effectively, okay, so the main yeast you hear about in wine is a yeast called Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae. And, and the, it's called baker's yeast for a reason. Bakers use it. It's great. It's a really robust, strong yeast. It can handle, it's about the only yeast that can handle a mid-teens or a 10 to 15% alcohol. So it's really important. You want to be able to ferment, finish the ferment. Saccharomyces is critical. It's a very background yeast, though, in the native environment. It is there in really small, small communities. You have a lot more of these other yeasts that are dominant in the native environment. And what, But what the difference and the problem with Saccharomyces is is it's awesome, increasingly awesome from five to 15%. Below 5%, it's useless. And so what we, you'd find is you'd have these ferments that would really bloody struggle. So you turn the heat up, you fill them with DAP, you'd be trying to push the Saccharomyces through. And you know, by bur turning the heat up, you're losing aromatic profile to try and get that environment going. You're trying to feed them. You're getting an unweighty, unyieldy, wieldy kind of wine production, but you're also, um, then they're not great producers of, of interesting characteristics in wine. And what we've found in the last 10 years is that first 5%, you want, that's where the native yeast thrive. They don't, they can't handle the alcohol, but they produce all of these really interesting aromatic profiles, really interesting flavor profiles. So that's all we're talking with native yeast. Very rarely do you see someone go, I'm taking native yeast all the way through to 15%, because you'll have, it will start falling apart very quickly after 8%. Um, and you find that normally you start with native, take to five, get the really interesting characteristics going, and then you get the Saccharomyces in there, you make damn sure it finishes, ferments dry, so you don't have any problems with the impurities or, you know, um, that can come out, the, the, the um, acetobacteria acid. So can I ask you a question about that, Will? Yep, yep sure. So are you using, do you use spontaneous fermentation or, or are there particular native yeasts that have been cultivated and have produced? You, you cultivate them in your, from your vineyard. So yeah, you don't, you don't just, yeah, you cultivate them. So you, you cultivate from your vineyard, effectively from your environment. So you can use, you can try for spontaneous. It's dangerous. <laughs> it's da dangerous. Like the slower the ferment at the, like you, there's the potential that it gets crowded out by not so enjoyable, uh, not so fantastic. Um, uh, microorganisms um so you do want it to start you do want it to to flourish um so yeah so you do create um and then you inoculate you don't have to sometimes you don't have to inoculate saccharomyces can sometimes get up off the ground um you see its curve it's very slow starting then takes off and everything else falls away um but it does get there um and uh it's interesting like the, and even the understanding of yeast like the french used to use dead goats like hundreds of years ago when a wine wouldn't ferment and <laughs> the expectation that it would kick off ferment but um that was a bit of a wives tale to some extent but 400 500 years ago apparently that was what they did before Lavoisier. no one had a clue what the hell was really happening um so anyway that's sort of 
so that was sort of one step one. Um, that's sort of understanding, and we're, I think we're still we are still evolving um, what we're doing. Um, the next is obviously a, a much bigger um, market being undertaken um, in, in in fixing up the the, the biome of the of the vineyard, the development of you know green manure. Um, you're seeing much less spraying. Um, much more about protecting the biome, you know, the, the, I guess the natural living organisms, which microorganisms which live within the soil and, and with the soil and also on the vine, um, which play an important part. And we'll come to that. We started working much more with nature rather than trying to sort of um, control it. Has caused issues with bushfires, might I add. This is why we lost so many vineyards um, in South Australia, as everyone now has you know, mid row, you have there's grass everywhere. It didn't used to be there. I remember speaking to the old timers, and they said back, back in the hunter, when bushfires would come in, you'd lose a row or two, and that the, the vineyard would actually stop the bushfire. Um, now it's the other way around. It seems to accelerate it. Um, so that was one problem, but that that's a that's that's a minor one. We deal with it any way we can. Um, and the other one is is then the appreciation that oak doesn't all need to be new. Mm. So it can be old in some respects. It probably should be old. Um, Chablis doesn't even use new barrels. That's, I've heard of stories of using out to 30 year old barrels. It's really, you're just looking for micro oxygenation. They're not even looking for an oak influence. So the, I always call oak the rich man's curse. Curse. It's an industry which has a lot of wealthy individuals in it. And they've gotten used to paying for their way out of problems. And oak is expensive. And so you buy more new oak to hopefully solve a problem. Um, in reality, um, the best burgundies, um, the reds, you know, they might be only 20% new oak. Um, it's interesting to see it, but that's sort of one thing. So we're even pulling back on, on oak in itself, um, which I think is a, is a, is a positive. The, the future, and this is where I guess the excitement is starting to come through. And I was looking at some great videos recently about um, the identification um, of yield using robotics. And it's phenomenal. The machine learning has now gotten so good that it can that it just, they, this thing fly, these things fly along. So you have these robots and they can, most of viticulture is visual. So the, I guess the identification of the mildews on the leaves, the, the spots, the, the oil spots, or um, I guess you can look at the color of the leaves. It tells you a lot of the deficiencies in, 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 in um, nutrients, but also water stress. You can pick bunches. If you know the variety and you know the clone, you've, you've already got a base set of, of information from which you can derive yield expectations and the like um, and what these robots can do is is they do what we would love to do uh, viticol and vineyards but they can just go up and down constantly and provide you with really detailed understandings of your vineyard and you see that with heat maps like on the right um, there where you can sort of see um, I can't remember which heat map that is but it probably has to do with um, probably has to do with moisture oh it might be moisture I'm trying to remember the um, can't anyway, the point, point is, is, is you get start getting a really uh, meter by meter understanding of a vineyard. And why that's important, in particular for Australia, is that we planted our vineyards with the expert with with um, using uh, machinery. We don't have cheap labor in Australia. We never have. It's why we developed combine harvesters. It's why we, you know, we're the most mechanized of all agricultural countries in the world, and no more so than the vine than the wine industry. And so we built these rows to put to put um, tractors in, had uh, to be you know two and a half three meters wide, and the net result was that you know you also had rows that were dead straight, and that meant that you never followed the the the, the true conditions of the soil or the ground, and so you ended up with rows with where you're picking to averages. If you're if you're mechanized here, and this year pretty much everyone's mechanized at the moment. There's no hand picking around unless you've got a lot of very 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 generous friends, um, and so you're picking to averages. You're, either, you're picking some that's underripe, some that's overripe, and you're picking an average of ripeness. Um, that does diminish the quality of the wine. Whereas what now we're getting to is the ability to go, the first five metres is great, the next 30 is terrible, it's not ready yet. The next 60 metres is, is great, then turn it, and you can now even start and putting that into the harvesters and the sprays and, and micro, well, um, irrigation is probably going to be a little bit difficult, but I am seeing it now where you're seeing three runs of, of irrigation tubing in some vineyards. Um, but you can now harvest it much more to deal with your vineyard much more like a French vineyard, which is planted to these um, micro terroirs that they've developed. So that's the future next step, which will really bring us in step, I think with the old world in particular. Um, 
be a, if we can pick everything everything perfectly right, you'll make a lot better wine. Um, I know a bit of generalization there, happy to ch chat more about it, but really I guess what I'm trying to get to is, is it's been an evolution um, with Chardonnay. Um, I think the real appreciation and where the difference comes down to it is the French school is much lower intervention. Um, the French school is much more vineyard orientated. The Australian school is much more winery orientated and much more driven by science in some respects. Um, but there's always the temptation to get involved and, you know, things aren't, you know, the, the lack of patience might be one. Um, also we're accelerating wines through a winery, trying to get them out the same year. Um, what we're getting to here is, is for us, what is this wine here that you're drinking now? So it's the Comtesse. So this is probably our, our pure terroir driven Chardonnay. Um, very low intervention levels with this. So we're talking um, no malo. We're not letting any acid fermentation into it. So we've left the acid fully in touch. So obviously we crushed a little bit with skins, which has been important um, because it gives it that um, bit more texture, but it's really been kept in steel tank. It's 15% in oak, new oak, but it's, it's a very small amount. It's very, um, it's probably medium to medium toast, um, uh, very little batonage, so very little, um, you know, ability for the introduction of oxygen into it. So you're trying to effectively create a pure Chardonnay here, a terroir Chardonnay. And I've sort of got the Chablis on the right. They're different. Um, what is interesting is our level of acidity. Uh, our acid levels are the same as getting up there, the same with, 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 with the Chablis, which is really interesting for me for the next steps that I want to take, um, my dad and I want to take with our Chardonnays um, in particular. That gives us a really good pathway where we can go. But this one I'm really happy with. It's a very beautiful fruit driven. Um, I, it's, it's not simple. It, it's, it's elegant. It's probably what we go back to. It's just a very elegant style. It's not trying to be too much. Um, and it does, I think, really well. It punches well on it, its weight. Um, in terms of matches um, and the like, it's, um, yeah, we found it really successful with um, a lot of lighter seafood and creamier um, pastas and those types of dishes um, really fits in well with that very high acid level as well. It can really break into, um, I guess, some of the fattier sides as well. So it's a, it, not to go overdo it, but, but we're happy with it. It's, um, we're not going to change this one. Um, it's a very popular wine for us. So do you have any questions about that one or? No, don't have to. No, it's delicious. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> very, very delicious. Yeah. It's a one a regular of ours calls it a veranda wine. Like you just sit in the veranda and drink it. Uh, who, who is who is the countess on the on the label? That's um oh that's that's our ancestor. So Murray Louise. So she um was quite a quite an attractive woman back in so this is seventeen sixty six, I think it was, so seventeen sixty or seventeen sixty six. So she was um so we, we were we're at Burgundy, but she was up in court. Um, we we um, and she was quite young, and um, she became the model for one of the Grand Masters, Louis Michel Van Lu. Um, and he painted that painting of her for the I think 1760 or 1766 Paris Salon. Still runs today, so it's like their Archibald Prize, effectively. Um, quite a famous painting um, back in the area. It was actually one of the paintings that was stolen by the Nazis. It was in the Rothschilds collection. Um, and they tried to get it to Linz and uh, to the Rijksmuseum or whatever it was, um, and fortunately got rescued in one of the caves. Um, it now apparently graces the wall of some Russian oligarch in Moscow. So, <laughs> so I think he bought it like 13 million euro or something crazy. But that's, yeah, our ancestor, Mary Louise. So, yeah. Well, I've got a um, question in regards to how you yeah. mentioned that um, uh, we've become very mechanised in our uh, mm. wine production. In, in regards to the straight rows, everything's you know two and a half meters wide, sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, three, have yeah. you have you done any have you done any plantings where you have disregarded that so that you could be uh, more traditional? No, no. It, the, uh, like one of my mentors, he, he's a he, he's planted a whole lot of bush bush vines, and you go. He, he's fortunately got a hell of a lot of. Uh, he always gets a hell of a lot of backpackers to help him. Um, there is, it's interesting to see some of the changing viewpoints on, on trellising and the like, you know, the BSP was the vertical shoot positioning is the way our vineyard was established. There's much more of a sprawl coming back because 
BSP pushes everything up and it's getting hotter and the sun's getting hotter. And so you're getting a lot too much light penetrating to the fruit zone. So you're getting um, sunburn in particular. Um, it's fine if you're getting really high vigor because it sort of spools out again. But there's now like you leave one side down, one side up. You want it, you're trying to get the morning sun in, which gets rid of disease. You know, obviously milk, the dew in the morning and then it, you want the shade on the other side um, when the sun, sun heats or the heats up. But um, no, mate, we're, we're, we're going to closer spacings um, because that provides more competition between the vines, which means that um, one, they get up onto the cordon faster. So you get a maturity level of your vines, but two, the vines are actually only having to do, a le having to do less work because they're not, they're not carrying as much fruit. So that, that's sort of where we're going. But look, we use some hand picking, but we, we also have uh, machine picking. We don't have at the moment a specific block for any wine. We judge which 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 block goes with which wine each vintage. So, you know, we, we're not yet at that. Oh, this block's for our three hundred dollar wine. So we're happy to have like one meter spacing and then and hire twenty people to hand pick it with tweezers. Not there yet. So love to. Uh, um, maybe maybe you guys can help us sell at a higher Vinny, price. We can do that. <laughs> Vinny and I'll come up and pick. <laughs> yeah, I know you've said that before. I'm like, uh, you know, the romance is it's we've lost very quickly when you see that. Mate, our vineyard team's pretty tough. When you meet them, they're, they're, they're tough guys. It's hard, bloody work. So as I'm long not... as there's a six pack at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. Day, absolutely. <laughs> well, as I say, all great wine is made with a lot of beer. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, that's the chart. That's the first Chardonnay. So back to a little bit about Burgundy. Um, always interesting. I always love um, putting things in their historical context because it it tends to, especially with France and most of the European wine regions explain why things are done the like Bordeaux you know with the influence of the Basques the influence of the English then the influence of the Dutch um, and how that created all the different varieties and the styles that they make um, obviously Burgundy a little bit different but but still um, uh, much more French in terms of I guess it's it's much more the center of France it's called the stomach of France where it resides but it it we're, we're originally a, a Germanic people, so Scandinavian. Um, we're one of the Frankish tribes. That, well, not Frankish tribes, Germanic tribes or auxiliaries. They effectively stuck around like they all did, but they, they were they were they were pretty much tasked to try and break up the Huns for a long time. And they gradually, as the Romans fled, left the land and they retreated back into Italy. They they took the lands between you know effectively Italy, France, and Switzerland um, for a period of time, and then. They got beaten by the Franks and, and subsumed into the Frankish Empire and naturally Charlemagne and the like. Um, and it was then split into two, which is where the interesting point is it got split into effectively what is Provence now, Lake Geneva, went to, um, went to, uh, they, they, went to they went to Holy Roman Empire, interestingly enough. And then uh, France took the, what is, I guess, more classically Burgundy these days. Um, but by this stage, so it was just a province of France by this stage. It lost its kingdom status. Um, I always loved that the, the, this 100-year war seems to have effectively driven so much of the wine production in France. But um, 100, during the 100-year war, uh, King John II gave the duchy to his youngest son, Philip the Bold. Um, so what effectively did was he bypassed his oldest son and gave this province directly and said, All right, this is your province now and for your heritage. So previously, the duke was always one of the sons. Um, and it was held back as a title that he could hand over. So effectively, he created now a hereditary line of Dukes of Burgundy. And um, that did ensure that they became incredibly wealthy. And also, as, as uh, John would know, you know, the Burgundians, we kicked, we kicked pretty much whichever side we wanted in the 100-year war. I think we fought on both sides at some times. So we sort of, we, I guess that, at that stage, you know, there was no really England versus France. It was just various French-speaking people who were all fighting over the French crown. And I guess the Burgundians just decided to kick out anyone. Um, but um, what was really interesting is Philip the Bold was a wine nut. Absolutely. He was a massive wine aficionado. And this is where Burgundy started um, getting ahead. And he should, it's called the Edict, it was Edict of um, the Gamay Edict or it was 1395. So he banned Gamay. So at that stage, Gamay was planted prolifically in Burgundy as well as Pinot Noir. And he ordered its removal within a space of a couple of years, which is a pretty savage. You can do that in a, in a I guess, an autocratic um, or, you know, autocracy. Uh, um, and um, and uh, he called it a very disloyal uh, variety. I, I don't know exactly why he called it that, but, but effectively he thought Gamay made terrible wine. 
and that was his personal preference. Um, but within that, why it really stood out, one, it removed Gamay, and so it made Burgundy, Pinot, and Chardonnay. And what it also did was it, within those laws was all of these requirements with regard to irrigation um, and pruning weights and vine weights. So effectively, he started creating a quality control in Burgundy that carry through to today. Um, and it started creating um, the reputation of Burgundy and wines. So they became very in demand, it became a very lucrative, wealthy province because of this. And that helped drive it forward to some extent um, to the power it then started to show. A lot of the vineyards were managed by two, I call them particularly um, boring orders, um, the clinics and the, uh, and the Cistercians. Um, they, they, weren't, they weren't like, we're not talking, they weren't out the, the Jesuits or the like who are out educating the world these guys effectively were the home bodies of the, of the monastic orders. And they used to stick around Burgundy and their job was effectively, they tilled these vineyards and they recorded religiously the comings and goings of vintages for about 600 years. And that those detailed notes were what gave Burgundy the ability to establish its appellation system to the minute that it is today. There's now 1,400 individually identified sub-regions in Burgundy's vineyards. They're called Clim Up. And that's all driven by the work done by these guys. They effectively identify which vineyards are better than others. Um, and they're able to do that 600 years. You have a hell of a lot of history. So thanks to, thanks to, the, thanks to the monks, the, the, nothing else to do, uh, to be honest. You know, there's a lot of people who think that would be a lovely thing, tending vineyards your whole life. It's probably, so it's probably it was smarter than some of the other orders. Um, it's very important for the future of the wines. Um, so, so that was probably done before a vine was even planted in Australia. A little, a couple Absolutely. of years, a couple yeah. of years, one or two years. But <laughs> well, I got I got a question on that because you talk about how much winemaking changed in Australia in what thirty years or something. But yeah. these monks, like I don't know, six hundred years ago, are saying that particular block is Grand Cru because it's whatever reason, and we yeah, have yeah. La Montrachet on there. Whatever. Correct. Yep. Does that not change for six hundred years, or does some technology or climatic or geological <laughs> change happen that we now could yeah. find a bargain there's some things at least that good which you get as a viage right today you That's... hear that quite often it's quite a it's like a marketing gimmick you hear that quite often now like it's like the... for the grand crew but you're not paying the price yeah. for all these premier crew areas and i think i think you're under <laughs> onto it there yeah Vince, you, i think you're you, it's exactly right okay and and john look that that the, the game the, the, there's a neurology game which goes on these days it's, it's next to Lasham or it's next to Latash, but it's not Latash. But it's, it's like literally 20 metres away, but it's a tenth the price. Um, now, that can be driven by any God knows what reason. But, but what, um, what it does and what it does sort of indicate is, is, is yeah, the Appalachian system was, was set. There's a lot more to it than, say, Bordeaux uh, or Champagne for that instance. Like Champagne's increased its terroir, its Appalachian boundaries a couple of times effectively purely for commercial reasons, they needed more champagne to keep up with demand. Whereas yeah. the, the Burgundy that's now heritage listed, which is actually a problem. It means that they, there's no flexibility. So, the, so it's probably not so much what has happened in the past, but what's happening now. The vintages are now two to four weeks earlier. Conditions are changing um, in the vineyards over there in particular, everywhere actually. Vineyards are incredibly sensitive to climate. There's talk of a desire to put irrigation in, but they can't. The Appalachian system stops them. So um, there's definitely room for, for change, to be honest. Um, and uh, they can't do it. And this is where, you know, they're controlled to minor wine battles between stems or no stems. Like there's literally pitch battles, you know, academic battles in Burgundy about whether you use a stem or not a stem. It's like, what the hell? Like it's a, it's a fairly, not a, not a major, sort of major, major yeah. component of wine, but, but that's what they're limited to. So, um, yeah, there, there's definitely some great, there are some great discoveries. Like there is some neurology, which is not worth it. And there's some neurology, which to frank, be frank is because a lot of it was also established by the quality back in the early 1800s. So a lot's happened. Take Spanish wine at the moment. Spanish wine is on a tear at the moment. You know, 30 years ago, there was some great Spanish wine, but there's a lot of ordinary Spanish wine. And a lot of that was to do with the lack of investment. Prices have gone up, money's gone in, quality's gone up. So the same is happening in Burgundy. There, you know, the premier cruise, everyone's now, you know, has access to money that they never had before, especially not pre-1800. Like it was a pretty, 
pretty peasant driven industry. It's very hard work, very small plots. Um, you know, it wasn't big returns back in those days. And from that perspective, a lot's changed. So there will be discoveries. Um, and it is the fun thing. Like, you know, you listen to the Jasper Morrises of the world and they do, this is like this. And I trust them, to be honest, because they taste and they go around. Um, sales reps, no, it's just a funny sales thing. Are there a number of people sell, trying to sell me Burgundy Village as though it's Premier Crew. I'd just get, I'd get lost, mate. It's not. So get Premier Crew, fine. Even Appalachian, fine. But Village, mate, it's deep soils. It's nothing like Will Burgundy. Um, but hey, Will, Will, could I ask you a question about Burgundy yep. and Ralston? Sorry? Yep. Yeah. While, while you were talking, my father, he was saying, he, he's of the understanding that the geology of Burgundy. Sure. Got to come to it. Absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Absolutely. No, no, sorry. Okay, okay. Well, please, please do answer the question when it comes. In your I will. I will. No, no, I will. Sorry. I'm, I've been getting a bit caught up on the history side, but I think sometimes these are, can be the, these are the fun, but ex exactly. Absolutely. Geology. I actually had someone recently say, oh, it's just a bit too much geology, Will. I'm like, but that's wine. Like, you know, this is a wine chat. Like, you can't, I can't talk about wine without talking about geology, but they're, but yeah, you're right. It's, that's the critical component. Um, I guess the, the final, very final part is, 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 um, is there's all, the one story I've always loved, and I can't, I would love to remember the name. I should look it up so I can use it as a good story. Is, is, is there was one of the Appalachians where the Vineyard Mom was sleeping with the head judge of the Appalachian system's wife. So he got premier crew and he, <laughs> they're, they're, like, they're a couple like that where, because, you know, they're, they're people. They were ha handing out, you know, Grand Crew to mates and, you know, and if you weren't their mate or you're sleeping with their wife, you, you got stuck with premier crew. So yeah, there's, idiosyncrasies um but well, that's the rest is a little bit of the background stuff but yeah it was a very wealthy area and it, it it supplied um obviously it was very easy to supply paris as well um back up the Seine river and the like back into the uh, loire and the like and uh interesting so they fill up the bold on the right um and uh see the cistercians on the left so we'll talk a little bit about um yeah we'll talk a bit about the terroir because if there's anything and any, um, I guess, evidence of the imports of terroir burgundy is ground zero. It's that 1400 individual climats, the, all the data collected over 600 years, 700 years by the monks. Um, and then the enormous amount of attention these wines get um, from the MWs and the, the Jasper Morrises and you know, the, the Jancis Robinsons and the like, you know, with great palates. So there is something there. Um, and, uh, I think it's reasonably important. So I love playing around with this sign. It's the Grand, Route de Grand Cru. <laughs> and uh, 14, 12,000 kilometers is about the diameter of the earth. So I'm being a little cheeky. Yeah, we're, not, we're not located just to Murray Symphony. <laughs> um, so the way that I like to break it down a little bit is, is what's the Australian approach? So we talked back in the tw 20, 2000s, cool climate started um, entering you know, our, our expectation and the discussion about wine. And we started going, oh, I want cool, cool climate wine. And from a Chardonnay perspective, that was probably advantageous. You started getting the acid back, you started losing the butteriness. Um, but it's very um, limiting for the simple reason that Chardonnay may like cool climate, but Grenache or Tempranillo or Nero de Avalo or Tariga Nacional hate it. You, they're never going to get them right. It's not a good quality indicator, unless if it's great for varietal selection, but it's it's very simple. It's a, it was a very simple and easy story. You can put it on a label, you can put it in advertising, your sales reps could get their head around it very quickly. And unfortunately it dominates the conversation here in Australia. Um, but it doesn't tell you anything about you know, the old world, um, in particular, once you get into a region, what makes a good burgundy, what makes a bad burgundy? Temperature, great. <laughs> You're telling me that that the, the valley has different temperatures. <laughs> um, there are some, a lot, you know, there are areas where you get cold channels, you get a little bit higher elevation, but it's, you know, relatively consistent. Um, and where obviously for us, French varieties are important. As you can see, all the French, all the French regions are reasonably cold climate. Um, Central Otago bottoms out there, um, which is, um, makes beautiful, beautiful Pinots, by the way. I'm a big fan of this. Um, so, what we're talking about is you're looking about uh, balance. So we always talk, I always try and take things back, balance in the vineyard, balance in the wine, balance between fruit, you, know, you can see it here, acidity, tannin and alcohol. And that's always driven by your fruit. So, so what drives those things? And this is where 
I guess, you know, when you have an incorrect uh, terroir for a wine, this can get out of balance. Out of balance can sometimes be good. Hunter Valley, Hunter Valley Semillon is a great example. It is using a Bordeaux white variety. It's in about seven degrees warmer climate conditions, but it produces that one, like one of the great wines of the world. Like the, so, so, you know, let's not get too caught up in it, but for us making classic French styles, it's very important that we, we were able to achieve balance and getting much more of an understanding of how balance is created. So how do the French talk about terroir, that more holistic picture, um, climate, grapes, um, that connection of varieties is important, but, but then there's the connection between um, inland versus coastal. So Bur you saw the temperature between Burgundy and Bordeaux is actually not that much different on average. Like if you were to put them on a plot, as I'll show you, and we saw just before, there's not much difference, especially related to Australia. The difference is one's on the coast, one's inland. So yeah, that's, that's important. Um, topography plays a large part, especially with sweet wine production on the Garonne River or between Sauterne in particular, gets that sea fog, whether you, maybe there's a valley fold, maybe even there's a fence above yours, tree line. There's the way that the land shapes does influence your, your, your variety and it can influence and make things a little bit colder um, and the like, um, or a bit warmer, um, where, which aspects the slide of the slope is a very big part to play in Burgundy in particular. Flora and fauna, um, we touched a little bit with understanding the biome. It does have a large part to play. The, there are native yeasts, even in, in Burgundy wineries. Um, they have their own cultures. They've done the genetic testing. Each, each winery has its own yeast. It's quite amazing. So they can, they can identify, um, they can, if you take the yeast in from different uh, wineries, they can identify them now. Um, that's one, but, but it's also appreciating that, that running around and how you interact within, within your environment. So using um, a lot more of native defense mechanisms, a healthy vine, like a healthy human is gonna reject if it's disease a lot more than if I'm stressed and it's out of place. Um, and also using native predators. So ladybirds, lacewings, those things have a large part to play in protecting your vine. So ladybird pretty much chomps through most vineyard pests. Phenomenally, phenomenal how powerful they are um, at protecting your vineyard. So using that, but also insectariums and trying to do things to in induce them has a large part to play. And I guess the big one then is, is soil. So we sort of indicate, and I'll break that down because I think that's the real um, keystone of understanding terroir. As I say there on the left, there is no winemaker in French. There is just a vineyard. They don't even have a word for winemaker. You get close to it in Champagne, Chef de Cave, because they are blending non-vintage. You know, they are buying multiple vineyards, but especially in Burgundy, unless you're if you're a negociant, um, you're not a, you, you, you're making what you have. That's your whole identity is your vineyard, your appellation, your Grand Cru and the like. It's not, hey, I'm, I've got this terrible vineyard, but I'm a great winemaker, people don't care. Um, and I always like to sort of say to a sommelier in Australia, name the top 10 Australian winemakers, check, 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 check. Okay, then the top 10 Australian vineyards are, ah, mm, um, ah, and reverse that in France, top 10 French winemakers, you're gonna struggle, but top 10 French vineyards, you can, you can come up with a pretty good answer. Most people can name, rattle off at least a dozen um, or half a dozen. So it's just a different approach, different, different approach. So, so well, the names you hear of in Burgundy, like La Fleve and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, yeah. La Fon, are they Dom, Dom, or are they just happen to be the family that's lucky enough to own those they're, vineyards? They're, La Fon and those guys are, they're, they're vineyards. They call right. themselves vineyards. So they own the land. So domain, the Druans, the domain. So, you yeah. know, they, they identify by their vineyard. So right. you, don't, you don't, it's interesting when you talk to them as well, they don't spend a lot of time talking about winemaking because it's, it's a process that just is for them. It has, doesn't, they don't have flexibility. They talk about their vineyards because, you know, that's what creates domain Romani Conti. It's not some guy in a winery going, I can take, I can, I can make it better. It's, I have that, tiny tiny plot of land and that gives me a stupidly expensive yeah. on the wine um yeah so yeah that they, they have a very it's a different it's a different just a different mentality and i think for me from my perspective as a family we think over 90 percent of wine is made in the vineyard like you, you your job in the winery is not to stuff it up effectively but make sure it ferments dry make sure that you don't get spoilage in there 
And then it's some of the decisions with regard to how long you want the ferment to go for. What oak, great. But, but really, you know, that's more like picking a frame for a painting. You don't buy a painting on its frame. It's important. It sets its position in the room, goes with what goes with the lighting. But in reality, you know, Da Vinci was a painter, not a framer. And that's the way that we look at it is the frame is the winery. The painting is, is the vineyard. So, yeah. I don't know. Nice. Oh, sorry, you got someone else. Sorry? There's someone else who's asking a question. Whoever that was, you go first. Is that Anne or just a, just enjoying the wine? <laughs> so, Will, I was just, uh, sorry, you've got a literary historian here in the in the group. I, I was wondering, do you know when people started talking about terroir, as when they started using the word in this? Uh, it was it really. You seem to have such deep historical knowledge. Well, when, when we well, the French have been talking about terroir forever because it's it's a it's just part of the it's just part of I guess the backstory that they talk about, but they don't talk about it. They don't take it to the science level that we do because they don't have to. They have the benefit of trial and error. Where where we needed to unpack it because we needed to work out how to replicate it, and we need to work out how to replicate it in you know in a couple of years, let alone you know, 20 years for a, now from a wine making perspective, but we didn't have, you know, a thousand years of looking around for the right conditions. So we, we wanted to understand it. They were much more, they, they didn't, you know, there were some general understandings. There were some general rules of thumb that they understood and they appreciated. And, um, and they were obviously, that was um, soil. That was the, the, the chart before. The, the next, the, the more detailed part that I'm going to take you through is more, um, the next level of knowledge which enables you to replicate it to some extent or at least get close and that's sort of um this is how you translate it to the new world and it's been done now successfully up in the willamette valley um you know all the amazing work that was done up there with the erie vineyard um and that, that sort of set the benchmark they came at it from a much more this approach um and it gives you the, the guts, my parents, the guts to, to go, you know, we're not going to plant next to everyone else. Like we're going to hurt our cellar door sales and we're not going to be able to share equipment, but it's going to be better wine. So hopefully, hopefully we get some recognition for that. And hopefully in, in 30 years, you know, or 40 years, people go, that's a fantastic wine. And we believe it. Um, hopefully faster, to be honest. But, but this is sort of a, I always use that. I, I can tell the, the story of the, the Lett family, you know, like, David was called an idiot <laughs> um, when he finished UC Davis and University of California Davis with his wine. And it was like Sonoma and Napa. And this is back in the sixties and seventies. He's like, no, no, I'm looking for marginality. And he went out in a hunt and he looked everywhere for, because he'd spent some time in France, an area which wasn't that conducive to viticulture in terms of a, a, for, for agriculture. So not, and he hunted and hunted around. Unfortunately, there'd been a hurricane had gone through Oregon and it flattened all of the, the nut orchards, the walnuts and the, hazelnuts and the like and he managed to buy some land sheep up there he planted his vineyard and and he just did his own thing for a long time and he was called nuts um then he came second in the you know the in the gourmio paris wine cup um to uh chambol musigny um with his pinot and that was like wow american did pretty well with pinot what the hell they're too hot and and yeah. they invited him back the next year and he came second again and and in the burgundy cup and he formed a great friendship. And it, what was interesting is he always said, uh, he's, he's gone, unfortunately. His son, Jason, tells the story now, is that, um, that what his dad always said is it's great to win those awards. It did increase any wine sales. It's a bit like us. We won best wine in Australia. Most people don't know. It doesn't move a lot. It gives you a bit, oh, wow, okay. But it doesn't really drive a lot of awareness. But what, it, what him winning those awards did was it made him good friends with Joseph Druhan who's one of the great domains in, in Burgundy. And Joseph and he became good mates. And they started, their, their young children at that stage started doing vintages at each other's wineries. So Virginie Druhan started doing vintages with, uh, with David and David's son, Jason, started doing vintages with Joseph Druhan in Burgundy. And that sort of, that, they formed a really, I guess, got on very well. They both agreed and they're both passionate about Pinot and terroir. And what happened though, was it said what created the Willamette Valley, because at this stage there's still only really one vineyard there, was that Joseph called up David and said, hey, mate, I've got some, mate, bonjour, mon ami, uh, I have some great news. And 
I, I want to share it with you. And he's thinking, oh, this new vintage, what's going on? You want an award? So, oh, I just want to tell you, David, we're not going to be neighbours. I bought the block just next to you. And he said that was what crystallised the Willamette Valley. When Drew Hunt and Oregon established there, it went from one to 700 vineyards now that it is today. So, yeah, anyway, that's marginality. So being crazy, being out there on your own, you know, we just got to convince some Frenchmen to come and plant a vineyard next to us. <laughs> Greg, that with, the, with, the, with, the, with that beret, you might be the perfect candidate. <laughs> that, I tell you, that, that Chardonnay is like a Mursa. I just love it. Oh, thank you, mate. Appreciate that a lot. Yeah, yeah it's lovely. I really appreciate that. Thank uh, you. Are you going to tell us about the land? Yep, and yep, I think let's you go. Got I did. I got <laughs> nice big segue. But Burgundy is like a if wine industry is a rabbit hole. The further in you get, pardon? The further in you get, the more you realise you don't know, and then you like, oh, crap. And you, you feel like you've got your hand around the rules of Burgundy, and as they say, there are no real rules. Like you, there's like, <laughs> it's like you know, clay clay soils you plant. Pinot in sandy soils, you do Chardonnay, and then and then you find this amazing vineyard, which is the other way around. You're like, crap! I thought I knew it. That's <laughs> just, just the way it is. Um, or regions are uh, Cote de Bone is Chardonnay, and uh, yeah. So um, yeah, it's um, Burgundy. Like, it's location with the France. It's a fairly confusing picture. This is about unpacking it. It's not complicated. Um, if you got a basic green thumb, you'll follow the story of why Burgundy is where it is and why the better wines are where they are. Um, but just the good things, obviously, just remember, Burgundy's right in the middle of France. It's called the stomach of France for a reason. It's not on the coast, like Bordeaux. Um, and you see all these plantings, they're plantings of vineyards, uh, uh, you know, the different colours, different regions. And these two purple swirls are probably a little bit more important. I'll explain those as we go along. So first one, centre of France, continental climate. So this is the difference between, and I'll just take you back quickly, Burgundy, Bordeaux. Cabernet, Merlot, Pinot, Chardonnay. Oh, Cabernet, Merlot, Simeon, Pinot, Chardonnay. Not a lot of difference in temperature, especially when you compare them to all of Australia's variability. It's to do with this, inland versus coast. So inland climates, massive, it's called diurnal variation, just very big temperature shifts, day, night differences. You don't have the sea regulating the temperature, making it, really nice and stable. You don't, you have these brutally cold nights and then very hot days. And, and what that does, and it's really important, is, is, it, is it enables the, the, the grapes to get that balance we talked about by, by ripening in synchronicity, like getting synchronized. So the sugar, the flavor and the tannin ripen and they've, you know, for Chardonnay and Pinot, the way they've evolved, ripen optimally in that type of environment. You know, that, the colder nights slow down the ripening process. It's important stops them getting ahead of themselves, enables the flavours to keep up. They also, as you can see, they develop, they develop some lovely, beautiful aromatic profiles, but, but they also, um, what I've found increasingly important and more so for red, is it's quite a brutalising environment and vines are living organisms. They do have living organisms prerogatives. One is protecting their progeny, their young, and the younger seeds and in tougher environments like this, they thicken the skins up, the skins bruise up, however you want to call it, and so you end up with not only with these wines where the flavor's kept up with the acid, but where the skins are a bit thicker. And for a variety like Pinot in particular, which is very thin skinned, which is why it's a bloody nightmare to make and a nightmare to grow and it's exposed to everything, um, it, it, it's important because that gives it more flavor in particular. So not just the, and that because you, you're getting more juice, skin to juice. And you're getting more tannin. And that goes back to that whole oak story we said at the start, had an important part to play. But effectively, you get more skin tannin, which means you don't need the oak. So even Domain Romani Conti is like 20, 30% new oak. Like this wine sells for stupid amounts of money, yet it's using a lot of old oak because it doesn't need to. It, it would overpower it, would ruin the wine um, and their freshness aromas. So it's just important for these varieties. They appreciate it. They thrive in it. Um, but saying that, Cabernet could still grow out here. They're just not going to pull Pinot Noir out to find out, that's for sure. Um, so that's step one, centre of, center of France. Step two is, is you, know, you know it's cold, you know it's the centre of France, this diurnal variation sounds important. Why the hell is it so constrained with its plantings? These, vines, these wines are worth a lot of money. Um, there's no reason why, if it was those two conditions only, you wouldn't have all the Burgundy covered. Just supply demand economics would say that you should plant more, but they don't. 
Um, it's very, very constrained. It's, the best bit is that 60 kilometres at the north, you know, and Chablis, I guess, which is northwest again, but it looks like it's southwest, um, is the best bit 60 kilometres long. It's tiny. Um, and the width of it is even smaller. Um, and uh, so that sort of indicates it's not temperature, not inland location, because that wouldn't be the reason you'd be so small. Like we'll go, we can go over more micro. This is the most expensive wine in the world. It comes from a 400 meter by 400 meter plot. It's tiny. It's you know, the best bits a kilometer wide. So, and uh, you can see it down here and you know, it gets down to the cheaper stuff and then up to the more expensive stuff. And there's a show. And point is, is very, very, very um, one minute, which was where the monks enabled them to get to this level of specific, specificity. I think I got the word right. But it also gave um, the ability to, you know, as you can see, we understand the restrictions of where the great stuff comes from. Really interesting. And, uh, there's, interesting, there's all other bits and pieces, but I can get into about the gaps and the fans and the gaps between the tree lines above. But, but the, the, the main story goes a little like this. So a really overly confusingly colourful picture. Don't So you should get some monks in Rilston to do that. It'd increase the value of your land. No oh, end. mate, absolutely. Well, you know, well, well, well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> could try. So I could try. <laughs> um, the, well, the first miracle is creating wine. So I guess we're already on the way, isn't it? So, <laughs> um, the, I, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know well, I was, hey, well, well, you've, heard, you've heard of the Technicolor yawn, haven't you? Yes. Well, this would be it. So this, is the, this is the geological spray. <laughs> so, so the, well, I'm, uh, sorry, I was just going to say, I noticed on the map there that Burgundy is split. Because yep. you've got the region in the north, and then there's the Burgundy yep. section, yep. and and it's all it's all classes Burgundy. And I, yeah, I was listening to this podcast today that explained that that a couple of hundred years ago there was over forty thousand hectares of shab of Chardonnay planted, and they ended up pulling all like they got disease and they pulled all the vines out. So that's why well, there's right. a gap yep. in between. Yep. And um, it wasn't and long it shrunk all the way down. Yeah, but it's shrunk all the way down to 500 hectares, and now it's in the 50s, and now it's grown back up to about 4,000. I just thought it was very interesting that there's well, why is this the gap? massive gap in between Chablis and the Cote d'Or. Ab absolutely, like yes. it, 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 it wasn't grown to a premier crew, so there wasn't the incentive to replant it after phylloxera came through and killed everything which is a bloody nightmare. But, you know, that's why Australia's got the oldest vines in the world because we haven't had phylloxera here except for Rutherglen. So be careful driving from Rutherglen to any vineyard because they'll get very angry with you. Um, the, um, so, yeah, so Ber the thing to take from this is, is that the vineyards tend to follow two general main trend lines, the good ones, and the giveaway is the term basin, Paris Basin and Aquitaine Basin. They made it really freaking and obvious for everyone by actually putting waves on them. So. Um, geological story. Uh, this would have been so much better as a 15 year old. I might have actually paid more attention to geology back then if I'd told it as a wine story. Um, but you have the great supercontinent Pangaea on the top left. Um, and it gradually, the continental drift started appearing. And bits like you're having in Africa and the Rift Valley is you start having a Rift Valley form between what is now North America and Europe, the Eurasia. And over time, it got wider and wider and wider. And then the sea was able to get in and it rushed, you know, down the length of this Rift Valley and then started filling out across all the shallow lands around it, which happened to be most of France. So the Paris Basin and the Aquitaine Basin. And this was the Jurassic era, warm era. Um, and uh, so the area um, around the coasts of the, this Paris Basin would have been very much like a nice Mediterranean holiday with Velociraptors and Sam Neill chasing them around or the way around, I can't remember. But the point is, 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 is it was a, it was a, it was an aquatic theme park, um, was most of France. And that's where I guess the story becomes important because in the seas you have plankton um, in particular and on the coast you have shellfish and the shellfish. So let's talk about the, the seas, plankton, huge densities in, the, in this warm sea. They, as they died, they layered themselves up from, from the, from the sea floor and it created chalk, and that's Champagne. So Champagne was located out into this Paris basin, out into the sea, 
but the rest of the French vineyards were along the coastline. And um, as we know from shellfish, they don't, you know, develop over tens of kilometres of width. You know, 50 metres, 100 metres, maybe 200, maybe 500, maybe a little bit wider, depending on headlands, tidal flats, coral reefs and the like. Um, and that's where all, all the vineyards, and that, that, that so those shellfish become limestone, so the, and the plankton become chalk. So, so Burgundy and most all these vineyards in these regions are a story of limestone. So you can see that's a Burgundy vineyard with fossilised shellfish in it. And why limestone and why champagne? And this is because they both are calcium or calcium carbonate. And those of you who have got a bit of a green thumb would appreciate, but your yeah, tomato tree in the back garden doesn't work so well. Um, and, the, and you want it to improve, you might throw a little bit of ag lime or calcium carbonate, crush up some shells that you're having from egg, your egg shells in the morning and you throw it in the, in the vegetable garden, you'll notice that the plants will start performing better because what they've done is they've neutralized the acid. So with this chart and what the way to interpret this chart is, is why Australian soils are traditionally quite acidic is actually most soils are traditionally acidic, just they don't have plant vineyards on them in France. Um, the reason why they're acidic is two reasons. One is we're old soil and wine is acidifying. So wine has a natural level of acidity. Um, and so that one leaves an acidic note, but more importantly, the soils are volcanic. So basalts, granites and the like are, are very acidic. And so we um, don't have a lot of limestone in Australia. So we have a lot of volcanic soils and that's what we planted on. So you end up with these four and a half to or five to six pH. That's pretty bloody acidic down here. The way they get around that is that they use tractors with spreaders and mine, they buy crushed lime and they spread it around, especially in Tasmania. So what they're doing is they're trying to raise the pH from the surface down, which means you've got to apply it consistently and every year. Um, not every year, maybe every couple of years, but you need to apply it a lot because it does wash away. Whereas if you're working on it from the, from the bedrock up, from the limestone under the soil up, it's always there. And it's also more importantly, it's at the depth where your root zone is most active and where the microorganisms are most active. And that's really important because what happens with the neutral soils is that the nutrients are more available to the vine. And this is where it's just basic plant biology that we're talking about here, is that at that neutral soil, it gets its nutrient requirements most effectively. And that gives it all those characteristics that can defend itself with better immunity, just general health and well-being, but better foliage, better skin thickness, better color. Um, you know, there's most things are available. It, it's pretty happy between six and a half and seven and a half is optimal range for, for a vineyard. So to get up there, you've got to put lime in your soil to get there. Um, so efficient soils, it's like pushing a marble, not a cube at the top. That's why I have that nice little picture at the top. It's easier. The vines just find it easier to operate. And efficiency plays exactly the same role here as it does with fuel efficiency. More efficient means you can survive with less of something. You know, you it's 10 litres, uh, you know, 100 kilometres or five litres, 100 kilometres. So it's 50 centimetre deep soils or three metre deep soils. It's getting enough with a shallow soil to feed the microorganisms, to make the nutrients available, to get the vines going. Um, and generally, um, this is what it does. So on the left is a, is a water-filled sack of juice with a little bit of flavour that you go and buy from Coles. Very refreshing, lovely. A um, lot of irrigation for deep soils because soils are your moisture reservoir. When it rains and you've got deep soils, that's, the vine just keeps drinking um, and it keeps drinking and it keeps drinking and keeps drinking. That's great in the first part of the season, but as soon as the berries start to develop, and we saw this, we lost to our Merlot and Chat. Shiraz this year, when we had the rain just before harvest, was the berries just keep growing. And not only do they either dilute, they also pop and then disease gets in. So the difference between a table grape and a wine grape is size. You want them smaller. You want more skin to juice. And the way you achieve that is by effectively putting them under water stress. And the way you get that naturally is by having shallower soil. So this is the best vineyard, one of the best vineyards in, in Champagne, 50 centimetre deep soil. Um, that's enough nutrient in that alkaline environment for the vine to get everything it needs quite easily. It's, it's happy, it's comfortable, but the grapes are water stressed. The grapes are struggling. So they've become really small. Um, the main Romani Conti, 
30, oh, it's even a bit shallow soils than that. 50 centimetre deep soil, very shallow soils. So, you know, for 22,000 euro bottle. Um, and the way it achieves its depth of soil, and this is where that topography is important, is that um, you have that mid slope. So effectively, the top of the slope is too steep. Um, soils are too shallow, you know, 10 centimetres, sometimes even planting directly into the limestone, mainly Chardonnay up the top. That's why you have it up there. Then um, in the bottom of the slope, all the erosion, that's where all the soil is gone. So that's where you get the village wines, you know, the cheap burgundies that now are costing us money these days, because apparently it's near Mont Rocher. <laughs> it's 50 metres is a long way in, the, in a burgundy vineyard. Um, because what that does is that slope, there's only a half a kilometre, less than that, a couple of hundred metres sometimes. So this is why the minute of burgundy actually becomes relevant is this, the, from here to here might, is 100 metres or 200 metres like that 400 metre move in, in the main Romani Conti. So that mid slope is just the right depth. It's, it's just the right depth of soil um, to get that very small grape. So, um, you know, they, they get smaller than that in Burgundy. I was trying to find some Chambal Moussigno. They're, they're very they're famous as the smallest of the grapes. They're almost pea size. Um, so you've got more skin to juice. And that's sort of, that's, that's so the, the 101 in, in, in what the French did, their terroir, you know, unpacking it so that we can replicate and understand and appreciate it is, is limestone creates the efficient soils, the alkalinity, and gives that ability for them to run on shallow soils, which means that then there's not as much moisture available to the fruit, which means smaller berries, means more flavor, more structure. It's, I guess, the steps to the Holy Grail, so to speak, the stairway to heaven. If we're going about down the Led Zeppelin path. And that's sort of what you're looking for if you want to replicate the French conditions. It's not the, the only way of achieving good wine, but it's the way of, if you want to do Burgundy, this is what they've done. Um, so next one, the Jeanette. Let's talk a little bit about that. So the other Chardonnay, if you feel the desire to open another one. Um, what I love is, is that you hear a lot of people, especially with Chablis, talk about the minerality of it. I can taste the minerals in it. The minerals don't pass through winemaking. Um, but, but what does is reduction. And it's, um, this is a mistranslation. It's not minerality you're tasting. The, the French call it goût de pierre à fusil. It means a taste of gun flip. And this is what, this is what we think of as minerality. And the way to, to, I guess, to replicate it is go and get a, a pebble, a dry pebble, put it in your mouth and suck on it for a little bit. They'll give you effectively that. That's why people, I think, mineralize because it, you suck, it feels like you're sucking on a pebble. Or I guess back when they developed this, it was much more like the acrid fumes and the taste in your tongue of all of the musketry going off. This is the minerality and it, and it comes from reduction. It comes from, um, in particular, um, in Chablis, you know, the lack of any oxidative techniques. They don't even, so they sometimes make the wine, put it in barrel, leave it for a year and put it in bottle. Don't even stir it. So the leaves drop to the bottom. There's no batonage. They're obviously topping it up. That's about all they're doing. And so you get a very reductive wine. And reductive wines, you hear so about it on the best. Pardon? What's batonage? I have no idea what that okay, is. Okay, so batonage. So apologies. No, that's good. Um, no, so I'm we, no, 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 no. It's good to please ask these types of questions. You can get carried away with terminology in the wine. We're like, it's, well, the industry is like doctors. You know, we use big words so when in reality we could just say Panadol. <laughs> 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 uh, in a good way. Uh, yeah, well, you're pretty well, winemakers. We do like the wine industry, we do the same thing, mate. We, we talk batonage, and like, oh wow, and it's like what it is is effectively you put a baton, a rod into, into the barrel and you stir it. And the aim and the desire is, is at the bottom, obviously, when yeast die, they fall to the bottom of the barrel. It's called lees or fluffy at lees. And um, because they're protein, they actually have uh, they have an influence on wine. It's, it's the process called autolysis, but effectively it enriches wine <clears throat> um, and uh, gives it. An inch, I think it provides a character to wines in, in a lot of instances, especially with sparkling. It provides that biscuit and brioche approach you see in the great champagnes. And um, so, what you're trying to do is effectively you're trying to mix that the lees up so they're not just sitting at the bottom. So when they don't do that, effectively the lees drop to the bottom and you're not mixing it through the wines. So you're not trying to impart any of that influence on the wine. But by doing that process, what you're doing is that as you're stirring, you're also pushing oxygen into the wine. 
So oxygen has a large part to play in the development of alcohol. You know, at one end of the seam, you have, you know, I guess, maybe Chablis and a very reductive style of Chardonnay. And at the other end of the scale, you have vinegar. <laughs> That's driven by oxygen. So you get that um, through batonage. You get it through using oak rather than steel tank. You use it by doing um, pump over rather than punch down. Um, there's all sorts of ways that, you know, you increase the oxygen content in wine. So I um, always love this. So I just love not, there's nothing really to ex explain here. It's just, just the, the minutiae, the tininess, the, the fact that the same as the, the, the area of uh, Domain Romani Conti, it's La, La, La Bata Monche. You can see the three Grand Cru's um, tiny area. Like this is just, it's, it's wow. that under four, the 300 to 400 meters again. It's, it's a hectare. Um, we have 53 hectares. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, but, you know, when you have those wines, if you get the chance, it's harder these days. But you can also see all the different, the, the, the Premier Cruise is still just as good, like to be frank. It's, it's that, the big difference is the Grand Cruise, from what my experience, and, and, and not my experience, probably not the right way to say it, from my discussions with people who have a lot more experience at drinking Grand Cruise, is that they're consistently good. Whereas Premier Cruise can be as good as Grand Cruise, but they can have they have much more variability. They go up and they go down, whereas Grand Cru senses you know freight trains along as a, just a phenomenally good wine, regardless of vintage. Um, whereas you know some of these, uh, the Grand Cru over here, um, that will produce as good a wine probably as Le Mont Rocher in some vintages. But you just got to know your vintage selection, and that's where the games start. Will, can I just completely derail you utterly? By asking, we've just we've finished our bottle of the, the, the Percival, which we really enjoyed. Oh, you've gone to Percival. You haven't gone to. You did, did you miss the Jeanette? No, no, we really enjoyed the Jeanette too. Yeah, oh, you've we're, done that too. We're, just, we're enjoying it great. Speed. Oh, so you're going to get to the Percival, okay? I wanted to ask you about the name of the Percival. Uh, okay, very, about... very quickly. I was just going to do the Jeanette quickly. Um, so the difference between the Jeanette and La Comtesse, you guys are, I guys, you guys are awesome. What am I drinking with you guys? That's the speed I haven't seen in a. Masterclass. <laughs> um, the the difference between the to two. To be fair, the session was supposed to be over already, but oh, you know, we're enjoying it. Oh, we love it. Oh, it's all right. We're loving it. Just These are masterclasses. Hour, okay, like, we're really enjoying it. How many slides have we got? Probably. This is, um, this is, I was not expecting this level of detail. Oh, you know, did... I'm an academic, and I was I was expecting something to be non academic. This is fantastic. You, you're oh, thanks. So knowledgeable. Thanks. Keep I'm going. made up. I'm making it up as I go. That's probably why I record these things to really try and you know unify my stories. <laughs> the the difference between the two is you probably will have experienced. Everyone else, please open the Jeanette or uh, boys. I'll get I'll bring some. And we can drink them next to each other. Um, is um, as you, one one is a vintage selection. 2017 was a lot colder. You said 2019 was warmer. Uh, was, the drought was that was the hundred year drought was well in effect in 2019. So that imparted the you can see the alcohol level here. So much higher alcohol level, but we were able to hold on to the, the acidity level, which was great. Um, there was a little bit of that acid fermentation, a little bit rounder palate, and more importantly, quite a bit more oak, so a little bit more oxidation in terms of batonage the leaves being stirred um, and uh, it's a richer textural type of wine. I, you would have noticed it's quite a bit bigger um, and uh, interested to see the difference between the two, to be honest. So what did you, if you read that, Greg and, and Michael and, and Anne, what, what's the difference in your mind? But you've had both. Well, yeah, like I, like I said, the Jeanette is, is um, it's really like the Merceau. It, I, I just, mate, you've made an Australian Merceau, mate. I Thanks. think it's beautiful. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether you're aiming to do that, but, you know, my taste is uh, sort of fairly mediocre. Oh, no. That's what it felt like to me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. We've got some guys who have Merceau vineyards who like who buy it. So, yeah. Because they go, we can't, we, can't, we can't drink our own. It's not a. Not a like to, for us to open it, it's like... I think it's, I think it's a top line. It's a beautiful one. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it a lot. Yeah, so this was... Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. I, I enjoyed the, the Jeanette very much too. Being on my own, I haven't opened both. I'm just having the Jeanette tonight and uh, 
I'll uh, try and I'll come to this another night. <laughs> quite all right, Adam. Just, just try the argon. It's greatly helpful. <laughs> Uh, the argon, yeah, yeah. The, if you get the, yeah, those are the. Yeah. It's such a smart thing to get the. Um, oh, what are they called? The. Yeah. My brain's mush. What's the the term with the argon? What's the, uh, coravin? Coravin. Um, yeah, they they are. Awesome. There's one. We 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 can't finish the whole bottle either, so we got one of these two. We're not the green bottle. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So imagine going to your cellar and you can try, you can pull out great wines and have them over a couple of nights. So um, it's like what I said, uh, like Vince and Matt, like venues having a, having them gives you the ability to have one wine that you can sell by 40 bucks or 50 bucks by the glass. You'll be surprised how many people will have it because they go, it's a Friday lunch. I don't want to drink a bottle, but I've got a lot of money. So shit, you know what? You've opened a Montrachet. I'm having it. Awesome. 50 bucks. Like I don't get to do this. So you can... They have a big part to play in, in you know, yeah. You guys, you guys have got Coravin, Matt. Yeah. You, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they, yeah. yeah. Dad's got Coravin. I wanted to make one other comment too. Well, sorry, you, yeah. you've given me too much delicious wine, and now I'm just going to vintage here and destroy your recording. But one thing I liked that you said some time ago was the difference between the way French winemakers know their wine and the way yeah. you know your wine. Yeah. You know, they they just trial and error, and you have the science. Yeah, and I, as I think you would know, there's two different words for to know in French. I mean, I think that's a nice yeah, point that you you uh, you you have sa you savoir, yeah, <laughs> you, 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 savoir so they, you you wine and they, they, they have the the connaître. Mm -hmm. Yep, connection. Wow. No, 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 not yeah. connection. No understanding. Yeah, that's yeah, connaître. yeah, yeah. yeah, the, yeah acquaintance. Yeah. I mean, we don't have this distinction in English. Yeah, the yeah. The, the, the the gut knowledge. You have the head knowledge, yeah. and they've got the knowledge, but. Obviously, the head knowledge is working quite well. <laughs> well, it, it, look, the, well, there's still a way to go. And the, the precision viticulture, those robotics, will take us take all of us to the next level. That's what we need to get really up to their level. Being able to do this, we can't do this because yeah. our vineyard rows, like our vineyard rows, 500 metres, like our vineyard is 1.5 yeah. kilometres long. Like it's that long by about that wide. It's, it's I, I can't see on the other side. And so that's sort of, the problem and, and the benefit is, is once we can put robotics in, we can start, we'll, we'll start seeing these delineations in the vineyard because the soils along a 200 meter long row effectively are going to go this and that and go up and down and there's going to be lower points and higher points. They're going to ripen differently. And that's where the robotics and the ability to bring it in to play will play an enormous part taking Australian is wine. That, is that existing in Australia yet? Can the you robotics? sort of get a Yep. will do that sort of thing, yep. that yeah. analysis. Yeah, yeah totally. So right. it, there's some phenomenal, I wish I could find, I'll find the link. There's, I saw, I sent it to my parents the other day because we, we, were, we were doing a fair amount with it and then we got hit by bushfires and everything. We just got distracted with the drought, bushfires and all that crap that went along with it. We we're talking to the robotics department at UNSW um, to try and do trials and become a, a, a centre. Um, a lot's been done in the United States. There's a lot more money in, in winemaking in the United States. Let's be honest, this you know, you got Spielbergs, and then, you know you got you got a lot. You got some pretty wealthy people who have a vested interest in making great wine there. Um, so there's a lot happening out of them. As also the proximity to Silicon Valley it also plays a large part. So not only do you have these tech gurus, a lot of money, they also you know have a vineyard just down the road, and they are able to trial out. So there's a whole lot of new apps that collect the data. You're now using satellites, flying drones, uh, driving drones. Um, it's just machine learning. It's just teaching a a vine that a Cabernet, you know, this clone should be, you know, have a bunch like this and the fruit should, you know, be this size. And you know, it's, it's not going to replace humans. Um, we just don't have enough humans. We, that was the difference. We, these guys had thousands of monks. We don't, so, we, we have like a couple so, of people covering this now in Australia. So Will, you got to, you got to become, sorry, on a first name basis with, uh, you've got to become first name basis with Gina and Andrew. Oh. Ryan and Forrest. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Twiggy, you know, Twiggy's the kind of person who probably would throw some money at something like this because, you know, he, he's got, he's, he's joined the 1% club or whatever it is, you know, it's where you give away 99% of your wealth when you die. He's, yeah, he's donating, you know, maybe you could donate to the improvement of wine quality. Um, but like, let's be honest, quite a few of the Margaret River wineries are owned by one, big, big West Australian mining magnates. So um, watch this space. I was, I did a chat the other week with a tech company and they're like, oh my God, so all of these switches and sensors that we make, you guys could use. I'm like, yeah, exactly. Like, like 5G networks. I'm like, we, we, 
the the wine industry is one of the few industries in Australia where we take it from the ground to a marketed finished product. The ability for us to improve that directly goes back to the producer. So you know that's not many but not many things we do in this, this country can we do that. So it's unfortunate we don't get any support from the government for that reason, but we should. <laughs> Um, there's no subsidies for our industry. It's the opposite way around. We're taxed about 40 to 50 cents in the dollar. But I think, I don't know, more than that, 60 cents in the dollar. Whereas we're competing against the French who are minus 18 cents in the dollar because the amount of subsidies they get in the EU. We are, yet we still do all right because, you know, we're, we're a bit more, we're, well, we're bigger and more resilient because of it. Um, so um, why do we fit in? I, I call it the, the Kevin Costner Field of Dreams analogy. You know, my parents built this in the hope that people would come. Um, 50 kilometres to the next winery, nothing in other wineries, no other um, vineyards in the area, no cellar door trail. This was sheep country. Um, and uh, great sheep country, my lad. The Pyramal is not far from here. And Pyramal is famous for providing all the wool for Xenia suits. So, um, but what makes good sheep country can also be good wine country because the soils are pretty rocky and, and uh you know pretty hilly you know it's not good country for growing big wheat paddocks um so this is having it here so from this point to the very far side which is a little bit of, down the next you can't see it is at 1.5 kilometers and from the left to the right up there up that, along that hill is 600 meters so it's about the same dimensions as you saw with the with the whole appellation in wow. in france so this is why i'm saying is we're we're still averaging we're doing averages we're trying to pick apart Robotics for us will enable us, you know, in here there, there's probably 30 different appellations or 30 different, very different climate conditions. And we've planted a lot of varieties. The reason why you see with our range so many wines is because when my parents made the call to do this, you needed scale. You can't plant a two hectare vineyard or three hectare vineyard out by itself. You will kill yourself. You can't afford labor. You got no support and you're never going to, you know, you, you're fully reliant on wine production. So my parents made the decision that they'd go all in, build a big vineyard, 53, 55 hectares of, vine, of vines. Um, the end result was to give us enough scale to sell fruit. So the initial plan was be a grape grower, be a vineyard, gradually become, uh, a, 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 you know, gradually make our own wine at a steady pace. You know, we have that longer time horizon being a family winery. Um, and that's given us the sort of the 20 year, turnarounds why we sort of appear, people go you've just appeared but old vines it's like yeah because we sold most of the fruit until we got to this point and um but because of that fruit sale mentality back in the 90s no one wanted chardonnay and pinot they wanted barossa shiraz mclaren and kunawara cabernet and hunter valley Semillon. so we planted those varieties too so this is a, a, mix, a hodgepodge of bordeaux cab merlot petit, uh, petit vidot and Semillon, bit of bit of bit of rhone valley shiraz and Bionia and Chardonnay and Pinot. And we've discovered that those rules that we talked about can be broken, you know, and you remember that Burgundy and Bordeaux aren't that different. And one's coastal, one's inland. And what we're realizing with our Cabernet in particular here is the very long hang times has given us, we're now top 1% of wines in the world with our Cabernets. And when we came here to do Pinot, we won best wine in Australia with our sweet wine. We came here to do Pinot and Chardonnay. What the hell is going on? Like it's, it, what's happened is, my parents found the right spot to plant vines. If it was a winemaking ability, there are a lot of great winemakers in this country. They should, you know, you know, but they struggle to make a lot of great wines. We do pretty well with a pretty broad range of 16 different wines at the moment. First thing we're looking for was temperature. So we started obviously from the Yarra Valley moving all the way up. Um, there's a lot of cold climate zones. This is where I really get a little bit upset when people go, oh, it's cold climates in Tasmania. The rest is warm climate. Bullshit. <laughs> Stanthorpe, right up on the Queensland border, is nearly as cold as Tassie because of altitude. So down here it's latitude, up here it's altitude. So there's obviously, uh, you know, you've got two curves moving against each other. As long as you stay in this zone seven, you're in the same temperature range as France. Um, zone six and zone five is probably north and south, well, sorry, central and south Italy. Zone seven would still be north Italy. Um, so it's interesting you see like the temperature differentials and What's, what's interesting is, is that, you know, you can see over here that the, the South Australian regions, which have the alkaline soils, they got it. They, they knew about alkaline that The Germans who planted vineyards there knew that limestone was important. The Terra Rossa is limestone soil. The limestone coast, Eden Valley, they're all in limestone soils. They're just a bit warm. They're, they're zone five and six. 
um, it's a little bit too warm for, for what we were looking for at zone seven. You can see it here, those are the temperature differentials or ranges. Um, we're really, we're right in this sort of French region, but we're interestingly, we're right down here with the, like in, this is the Tasmanian temperature ranges. We follow them quite closely. Um, not too important. That, the big one is, is what well, well, it's cold, great. But, but one next one is, is, is that temperature variation. This was a week and a half ago when I put the slide in a pack. Um, there you go, that was a minus three. That was a nice morning. We're just getting the bud, but bud burst started in the last week just before it could cause any damage. <laughs> it was like, last year we lost 80% of our Chardonnay um, and a lot of our Pinot. Um, but we have frost, it's, that's the, the danger of the beast. Burgundy lost most of its vintage this year to frost as well. So right on the edge, that marginality, that David Lett and the Will Willamette Valley you know, mentality. But the big one here is just showing that temperature variation, 28 degrees difference, Crazy. minus three up to 24, like your summertime to middle of winter time, one day. Um, not so important this end because we're in spring, but this comes back to play in autumn, which is when you know you're starting to get the vines that last period with the fruits on them. Okay, so just mimic. So this is the same temperature range you're having in March, April, and May while our while we're getting our vines to that positioning. Okay, um, the big one well, was. Yep. Sorry. sorry to jump in. Well, do you do you track that for each block, and and are there differences? With yep. your blocks yes yes yep, yep. this is uh, yep there are differences so altitude river um uh, there's also cold um so cold air runs like water and um and so there depending where on the slope you can get these cold channels and you see them with frost burn um areas which get much more hit by frost than others so yeah it's important to to do them we only do a couple of blocks because we're just looking we're more looking at the moment for frost warnings because we then we have these big frost fans that go off they raise up and they spray around like huge hair dryers. And um, so, yeah, so that's sort of. Um, so, Will. Yep. Yeah. So, is the harvest in Ralston a month later than the hunter or? Two months later than the hunter. Two so months. We're a month later than Mudgee. So, we start in February, end of February. Well, February is, is end of February is, is spa, start of sparkling, underripe Chardonnay and Pinot. I won't be talking. And then March. <laughs> I'm sorry, March is. Um, it's almost over. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying, did you have headphones on? You could... I, I'll, I'll, I'll put Matt. He looks sounds like he's negotiating. I'll give him some privacy. <laughs> the, um, the, um, the 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 um, the so we do then uh, whites and early reds in March, like Pinots, and then we do Aprils, our Cabernet Merlots and Shirazes. So yeah, quite a bit later. Yeah, it's so, a lot later than I thought. Yeah, yeah, a lot. Yeah, well, we're Huge hang time, which has great advantages for tannin ripeness, massive advantages. So the big, um, the big, I guess that, that was the, the locate, as I said at the start, temperature, inland location, it's not the critical importance. The importance is finding that geology. And, and like the, you know, the Pangea story with the rift valleys and the water coming in, the big one here is, is you know, take it back another couple of hundred million, 300 more million years, and you have the, have the Ordovician era. So this was the other great supercontinent and um, at this era where we are in Sydney, where Sydney was well below water, um, and you had a volcanic chain of islands, which effectively ran between Sydney and, and, and uh, probably around Katoomba Way, effectively. And, um, and you see that the caps actually around Mount Wilson and the like. Um, and then on the Western side of those, you had effectively, you had a, a small sea, and then you had the main, the started getting into Gondwana land proper. And it was on that leeward shore, that western shore, that inside shore of those away from the big swells, you had, um, you had the deformation of these amazing coral reef systems, huge long coral reef system, a lot of shellfish developed. Ordovician era was, was the era of invertebrates, was the era of shellfish. So um, this, this system, it's a very long line of limestone that runs north-south, um, effectively on the western side of the Blue Mountains. And you see it in Janolan Caves, you see it in Wombian Caves, and you see it at Ralston and Candos. Problem is, is it's so old, it's, it's at depth, it's quite deep. Um, but in certain areas where it's been pushed up or for whatever reason, faulted up, it comes to near surface. And this is a, a, a geological formation map. And you, Ralston, you actually see Ralston there, Kajigong, Mudgee, they're just off the coastline. You can see this is the Hill End Trough. It's what that, that shallow sea was called the Hill End Trough. That's what it's called that these days. Um, but it wasn't called anything back then. There was no one around to give it a name. 
and yeah, you had this tidal zone along here, which you can see, and then you can see this, um, the coral reefs sort of forming around there, and we were literally right just on the coral reef and just behind it, which is why it gave us enough width, 600 metres of width, and a couple of kilometres of, of length. Um, the way we found it was purely a approach to look for um, the foundation stone or, or where, you, where, you, where you, limestone is crushed cement. So what crushed cement is, 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 is obviously, you know, if you're out looking for a cement bag, I can guarantee you that it's not an expensive mineral like gold. Um, so you don't have, there's not the economics to go and dig it at hundred meters of depth. You need to dig it pretty much from surface. So if there's a cement mine around, it means that limestone is really near the surface. <clears throat> so this is where you, this is your starting proposition. So there was no more famous cement mine in New South Wales than Candor Cement. So he built the Harbour Bridge and that was the, found that and that's right next to Ralston. So there was no delineation between it. You can't really see it here, but the cement pits just here, um, that's, this is a tiny scale. This is the village of Ralston. And you can see this little formation that sneaks in here um, and a little bit here uh, of limestone where the rest around it is very hard Ralston volcanics, very tough, hard soil. It covers it. You can see these were effectively would have been a lava flow. We went out into it and around it, but just, just a little bit was exposed, just enough for us to, to discover this little valley, which we planted our vines on. Um, I won't go too much into it, but you can see like the, the, the hills, we've got a good slope there, um, very in depth. Like we've got, this is Cabernet country down here, a bit deeper. So with the deeper soils, if you sat from a Bordeaux, you appreciate the Cabernet, you know, likes deeper soil. It's happy and deep, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mind deeper soils because its skins are so thick that they reject the water. Um, but up there, that's all Pinot and Char Pinot up there in that area. Um, up on the up on the side of the hill where it gets right down, and the the limestone comes through the surface there. You're walking through rubble of it in the on the vineyard floor. So that's what gave us the, the pH that we were looking for. That cold inland pH so sort of gave us that building block. I, we're not on the route to Grand Cru. Maybe we will be one day, <laughs> but you know, as I, I've sort of said, you know, the 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 importance, the minutiae is everything in Burgundy. Um, and this is that mid slope where the soils are just the right um, depth. And it's produced these, these wonderful, incredibly expensive and, and frankly now unobtainable wines. You know, if you get a chance to ever have Romani, Romani Conti, flavor wise, it will be, it, you'll be mate, you'll be blown away. Is it worth the money? Probably not, but it's still better than any, any of the other Burgundy. So it's just great to get, to get the benchmark. I feel sorry for anyone going for their MW these days. Apparently the price ticket to taste enough wines to get the palate knowledge up is something like $800,000. So what? <laughs> the only way you do it is, is you share the wines, you, you form drinking groups and, and yeah. hopefully you're a master sommelier. You're a sommelier at, you know, like the French laundry or something like that, where, you know, they, they do have a cellar with Domaine Romani Conti in it and someone who's extraordinarily wealthy walks in and has, oh, there's a bottle and you, have a little taste before you give wow. them the bottle to check that it's not corked, of course, but that's how you get your palate knowledge. Um, so Pinot, no, uh, Pinot, as I said, it, it's, it's the real, it really, um, like Chardonnay is important too, but you know, you're not worrying about skin so much as Chardonnay. Yeah, you, you crush with the skins, but you're not looking for any skin extraction. You're not making orange wine, you're making white wine. So you're not really any skin contact, but with, with the Pinot, you know, that really small berry extra skin is critical. So the, the, the knowledge of this stuff really carries through. That gives the mid, mid slope um, knowledge base. And this is the, <coughs> sorry, I need to drink a bit of water. That or I've got coronavirus. Um, I've been double vaxxed, it's all right. Um, so I'll just drink the next thing I know I have to water, so. <laughs> I just, I just, I just, just changed. Where's Greg gone? He said, oh, not Greg, uh, Michael, about they're getting monks and Ralston. There we go, mate. I just, just got a glass of water. Just, just, just picked it up and this happened. It's all right. I'm, I'm a doctor and alcohol kills coronavirus. Mm, mm. Uh, you'll be right. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Correct. This professor of surgery says, just try some disinfectant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm with Trump. Yeah, no, no, you're not having invermycin there, or what's it called? Yeah, the dewormer. Oh my goodness! I know, I've got a door. I've got children in childcare. I probably have to get back on worming tablets again, don't I? Great. No, just, just, just don't, don't suck your finger. You'll be right. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be a problem. Um, if you're in the wine industry, there's a lot of chewing of nails. So, <clears throat> mm. um, so it, 
<laughs> sorry. So Pinot Noir. Um, yeah, interesting. So the, the, the one thing, obviously, with, with Pinot Noir, the difference between, I think, well, I think Central Otago gets it, Oregon gets it, and Burgundy gets it, is they get that skin development. And what that does is obviously makes it more medium tannin, medium body. And that, to me, is why I feel like Pinot in Australia is starting to get a reputation for being a light wine, which it is not. It's medium designed for Burgundy cooking. Burgundy food, wine and food have been a natural match. Things evolved together in France for a reason. The Basques and their salty seafood created Bordeaux Blancs. The, Merle, the Merlots were developed because the Bordeaux people used to drink, uh, eat young lamb. So they didn't need the high tannins. Um, Bouffe Bourguignon and the rich sources that you see in Burgundy had a bigger wine. Like some of the wines were pretty bloody powerful. So what I've been what I've been um, looking for, and what we've been looking for, what we've been looking for in our wines is some of these more spice notes to start coming through the cloves and the tobaccos and the mushroom, the mushroom, the forest floor. But you're looking for that aromatic profile, and I think that's really the real signature of Burgundy is it has this incredible aromatic profile. You won't see it in most Australian Pinots, sadly to say, and they just don't have the skin. The skin is where you, I, I find, the skin is where you get a lot of your aromatic. It, it gets not just flavor, it's aromatic. So it's your volatile phenols, the ability, the perfumes come from, from the skin naturally. And, and, um, and when it's gone in the Burgundy environment, that's what it creates. It creates that, that, the, the, these spicy notes in the middle. So that's a signifier of them. I hope with our Pinot, we're getting there. I, 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 I'm talking to some winemaking mates who are confident that they could smell these spicy notes in there. I, I sort of could. Um, the, you know, it, it's a progression for us with Pinot. But the reality is it is, is, is um, for us, it's getting that, that luscious middle palate characteristic together. Um, but it's nice to hear that there were spicy notes for it. So the Pinot that you're seeing at the moment, 2019. Um, so it's a bigger year. It, that was once again, it's the 100 year drought. So you didn't have that delicate, um, much more steady development of flavor. It was a bit faster. So I find it's not, I've compared this to an eight, our 18. There isn't as much flavor developed in terms of some of the middle palate um, from it, but still good pH, still good full acid. Um, we don't add any acid. Interestingly enough, in Australia, you can add acid, but not sugar. In France, you can add sugar, but not acid. To your wine making profile. Um, it is 100% Pinot, I can guarantee you that. One of the little dirty tricks you see in Australia, it's, it's not a dirty trick, it's blending. Um, you can blend anything up to 14.99% into a wine and not disclose it on the label. What happens with most Australian Pinots is they've got a lot of Shiraz in them, 10 to 15% of Shiraz. It gives them the body, gives them the character. It's why you see these coastal Pinots where you're like, you should not have the skin development, yet they're big, it's Shiraz. Um, the and some carbonic maceration over, but you know, over relied, but it's mainly Shiraz. Um, the the point here was it was it was our, this is our non-reserve, so we don't yet have a reserve for our Pinot, and we're hoping to produce one this year. But because we lost so much of our Pinot to to um, frost, we had to you know concentrate all production. Um, to give you an idea, we our yield was one point five tons a hectare on our Pinot this year, which is just stupidly small. That's that's thanks. Thank you, Frost. Um, will mean that 2021 will be a signature Pinot vintage, to be honest. It's going to be really high quality um, because the vines were, all that energy of the vines has been put into a very small amount of fruit. Um, not intentional, might I add. We're already at low yield. We didn't need that low. Uh, so uh, fermentation, reasonably slow fermentation. It would be nice to go a little bit slower. This is our, I guess, our, our main line, um, our main line Pinot. Um, I'd love to see, like some of the Burgundy, Pinots take uh, over, don't finish fermentation until the next spring. Um, they have very cool cellars, and that has a lot part to play with um, retaining some of the perfumes, the aromatic profile. You know, it's it's a great way of softening a wine up is with a hard, fast ferment. Um, but this in particular, it gives it a little bit more. Um, I like it a little bit slower, um, but it is what it is. A, a, a fermentation. Um, slowness relates to temperature and if it's a hot year and it's a hot environment that's a lot of air conditioning and if you're looking after you're trying to be a bit more carbon neutral you know you, this is going to be a problem for the burgundy sellers the, interestingly you speak to a lot of the guys in the know and they the, the general consensus is burgundy produces better fruit in warm years 
So the fruit will improve, is, in, is improving, but the cellars are getting warmer. So fermentation is happening faster and that's a problem for them. So, um, but it's also a problem they can probably manage with their appellations. They could just put air conditioners in them. But some of these wineries over there are pretty bloody small. Um, the obviously 20% new oak, um, fine, medium toast, 12 months. Um, the, so th this was, we're still trainer wheels. So our first Cabernet vintage, Cabernet has got a high level of vigor. It gets up onto the cordon. You get a good canopy to support fruit relatively quickly. We produced our first Cabernet in 2003. 2006, we became third Cabernet in the world to count World Wine Awards. Um, first Pinot we made under our own label was 2016. So it just took a long time. It's very low vigor varieties. Um, there's an extraordinary amount of patience required. Um, so we're still trainer wheels. So we've been working out fermentations. We've been working out oak utilization, um, working out yeasts to use, which we're talking about inoculation and, and, and natives, you know, what percentage and how you want to develop them. If you're doing a longer ferment, you can, you don't have to, you can be a little bit more um, spontaneous than inoculated. Um, but um, what's been also interesting is, is that these are some of the little hand movements, little slider hands that we use now when we talk about um, cleaning wines up. So they're called fining and filtering. So very quickly, I'm going to PDF this presentation. You guys, if you stay on the chat quickly afterwards, you can all have it. You can have a read of this in depth, but this is always a good one. This is fining. So fining is, uh, beer is a great example. It's an Asahi super dry against a Cooper's. You know, a Cooper's, you see the sediment in the bottle, Asahi super dry is super clean. So effectively it's been clarified. So clarification is fining. Um, and uh, it normally happens, the reason why we rely on it a lot in Australia is, is that we make wines pretty bloody quickly because we're trying to get them out the door because we're making a lot of wines and you know we don't want to invest the money in developing an enormous inventory. Uh, we can't afford to if you're making 10 million cases. So there's a lot of, I guess, mixing and moving and, and the like. And um, that, this has two parts to play. One, one, it means that the sediment is all through the wine, so they're, they're a bit cloudier. So what do you do? You go and get finding agents. You can see them on the right, the various, uh, some of the different ones here. Well, actually, and, <laughs> so what, the main reason you use them is clarification. And, um, or uh, <laughs> that's why the rest is there. And so you drop that through the tank and what it does is it, is it clumps together all of these leaves, pushes them to the bottom, you then rack off. So effectively you drain the wine just above that and you get a clarified product out. Um, so that's, that's one way you get a cleaner wine. So when you're moving around a lot, with Pinot you don't wanna move a wine around a lot. Your pumps are pretty bad on it. Even hates being shaken in a delivery. Um, but, but the thing with finding agents as well is as you look here on the right, they also do a lot of other things unintentionally or intentionally. So, you know, you're thinking, I want to put some, you know, isinglass, which is uh, fish extract. Great. It gets clarified. It also reduces bitterness. Oh, and it also takes out some tannins. Shit, I didn't want that. I want, to, I want my tannins to be taken out. So putting these things through changes the fruit, changes the wine. So we spend a fair amount of time not moving our wine around. We spend 12 months there, you know, just alone in oak. So we just rack it off. Um, we don't need to use a fining agent to clarify it. It self-clarifies. That wine you're having there is not fine. It's clean. It's clear. Not clean. It, it's clear. It's enough. And, and because of that, we don't lose some of these other things. Like, to be honest, this is great because if you're a winemaker, you look at this and go, shit, I mean, it's a bit astringent. I want, and that's where you actually start amending. But when you're not trying to amend, it shows you the dangers of using these fining agents. So the next one is filtering. So the reason why you filter is, is that the, if you've got terrible fruit or bad quality fruit or there's disease in it, it um, what it does is, um, is it makes a wine, it creates instability in wine. You can go off um, is one way of saying it. And um, they're called volatile acids is, what, is the way is your benchmark for understanding the level of these, uh, the danger, the risk that you're at. Um, if your fruit's good, it's coming from your own vineyard and you've got a well-run vineyard, you don't have many volatile acids. But if you're, you know, Lindemans and you're buying fruit from a thousand vineyards and it's varying qualities, you know, you're going to have all sorts of bloody problems in there, I can guarantee it. Or if you're a natural winemaker, the poor bastards, they don't have the money. So they buy whatever fruit they can get and it's normally full of problems. So that's their problem. That's why native natural wines aren't working yet because they don't have the money to buy good fruit. If you had a natural winemaker who's buying the best fruit in this country would be beautiful wine. It'd be very similar to Burgundy. They don't do anything to it. But the problem is, is 
that it has <laughs> the fruits, the, there's problems with the fruit. So one is this, the same as before, filtration has a large part to play. As you do anything with wine, it takes out things. So because why, well, the reason is because um, flavors, tannins, they're all chains, they're polymers, they click together. You get different compounds as well. You have the bad ones and the good ones connected together. You put them through a filtration, it sucks out the volatile acids or, you know, um, and, but it'll also take out flavonoids. So these, especially when it comes down to, um, to your perfumes and the like, which are very delicate, that's where they get knocked out really quickly. That's the first thing you lose. I've noticed that quite a lot of our perfumes have gone up by removing filtration. We don't need to do it. The fruit's in good condition. And this just gives you an idea, just the proportions we're talking about. Like, you know, so, so you're th talking about taking small amounts out, well, you're already talking about tiny, tiny amounts that create the great things in wine. So removal of those things. Um, the future for us, this is probably the next step. And this is where the reserves are coming in to play very quickly is the clone selection. So we have four clones that are in production and we've planted a fifth clone. So we've got 113, so 114, 115, 777, MV6. It's not on here, but it's, ma it's um, uh, Master um, Vine 6. We've also planted um, the, it's called the Gumboot or Able Clone. It's not on here. But, but what I'm trying to say here is, is, is this is the next, this is for us. We haven't even done it yet. Percival is just a blend of these. So I, I always use um, lavender as example here is we're looking to put some lavender in English lavender and I rang the nurseries up and they're like which one do you want I'm like well the English lavender like the, the one you get in Provence and they're like yeah but which one and I'm like well, what do you mean which one and they sent me a list of English lavenders it was about 200 long and I'm like what the hell and like these are all yeah these are all uh, they, it was lavender and gustafolia I'm like great there's pink purple orange white culinary perfume fragrance you know soaps and I'm like holy hell same with Pinot, same with Chardonnay, same with Merlot. There are clones and they are very different. So what we could plant two Pinot clones next to each other and they'll produce a different style of wine. And you can see it here, I vaguely, you can actually tell you the things you're going to get from them. So, so what you try and do with Pinot and the way we, we're going to go with our reserves is, is you make four different wines and, hope, and then ultimately five different wines. You ferment them separately. You do the first, you do the fermentation. So fermentation separately. You then do a blending table and you start working out which ones you want for your reserve and the rest just go well, go into your other wine. There's nothing wrong with the other wine, but that's how you get it to us to the next level is we'll be looking this year, 115, 777, and, you know, uh, and we'll do 60, 40. And then next year it might be 114, 115, MV6, you know, 30, 30, 40. And that's sort of where we're going to go with our clones. This is, this is where... I'm sort of indicating to you, this is the rabbit hole problem that is the wine industry. The more you know, you're like, I finally got my head around Pinot. I understand. And they go, well, is it Pomard clone five or 115? <laughs> you're, and you're like, <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> so do you want earth spices or do you want rose petals? And it's like, oh, God. And that, that's interesting. And, and they grow. This is a generic example of, of where they grow to. That changes by vineyard too. So our our MV6 and 115, 114 won't taste like, you know, Kuyong, won't taste like um, you know, Felton Road. It won't, so it will all taste different. They're very specific. So um so yeah, that's sort of, I guess, a bit of the peanut. So that for us, happy evolution. Next step for us is clonal separation. Um, and that will get us the reserve. Hopefully, we'll have one next year. Be named Richard after my father. Uh, the Jeanette is named after my mother. Um, so Greg, you asked the, where the Percival came from. So a lot of people used Holy Grail in the um, in the the discover the desire to create Pinots. Um, so many stories of people losing their shirt over trying to make a Pinot. Sorry, Michael. Greg, Greg just muted you. Anyway, sorry. He's making a Monty Python reference. We've found a whole bottle of Percival. That's it's all right. With I was going to make a Wagner reference, but I, I actually read your table. And it's, 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 good reason. It's, I, I think you've picked it very well. Well, it, it's just a scratch. Don't worry. <laughs> so, come back and fight me. Um, the, um, the, the point here is, is, is Percival. So, so Le Comtesse, um, so not Le Comtesse. So if you've had the Blanche Fleur, which is Blanc de Blanc, means white, white flower. Um, 
So our family name is Beaurepaire. Um, it appeared oh, around, it appeared in the, oh God, when was it? It's going to be 1200. Um, and um, our ancestor was a lady called Marie of Champagne. Um, and her daughter was Scholastic, who married David of Macon, which is obviously in Burgundy. It's how we became in Burgundy. And then um, the French crown, they acquired saint eloi which is the eastern part of Burgundy off the Holy Roman Empire. And that's where our family um, moved to. And we had the, where our job was to defend the, the eastern border of Burgundy with the Holy Roman Empire. And we named the town Beaurepaire en Bresse. Um, and we had all the land around it. And um, in Marie's court, um, was where Chrétien de Troyes wrote the first quest for the Holy Grail. And it was about um, a love story. It wasn't a damn Vinci code, and the, but it was a love story between Blanche Fleur and Percival. And um, in fact, the night Percival was out trying to find the Fisher King um, to make his king better. And uh, on that journey, um, he came across a castle under siege with the knight Gournemont. And he um, met the lady, of the lady of the castle. They fell in love. He then beat Gordamont and raised the siege and they fell in love. And the, the, the castle's name was Beau Repair. So, and that's where I, a name, the, connect, the connections are a little hazy, but I know that it sort of appeared, it wasn't really our name. Like it's like the, we had a our real name, I think it was Capet, but the, um, but you know, the, the, it's like everyone just, you started naming yourself after the town you came from and we just happened to have that same land for about 900 years. So it was, I don't know, but the reality is, is, is it's countryside um, and we're famous for uh, poulet de Brest. <laughs> so, which is the, it's the very signature French chicken. It's got the red um, frill, white body and blue legs. So. Um, well, Percival, Percival was the knight who found the grail. And I'll tell you what, this wine is really delicious. So. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Well Thank you. Well named. Thank you. Well, well, there was always a joke where Blanche Fleur comes from Beau Repair, which is a good hideaway. What the hell does that mean? So. Um, and Murray of Champagne, but her brother was the king of Jerusalem at the time. So, you know, it was all, there's all those intricate stories involved. But Dan, we, Dan we Brown, eat that. your heart out. It, you, you, the holy blood story, it was, it was a love. Chrétien de Troyes was famous for writing. It was the first medieval romance. And that was the way the story went. You can go and listen to it. It's, a, it's, a, it's some stupidly long singing poem that it was, um, they used to sing in the courts. And, and uh, Anyway, it was a love story. So there wasn't there wasn't any real Holy Grail. It was the Fisher King, and it was a lance and a dish. So everything else that Da Vinci Code, everything is based on a bullshit because this was the first written account, <laughs> and uh, they all elaborated upon it, and that's how you got the Vinci Code out of it. So maybe. So okay, right. Um, so that was the end in terms of the Pinot. Um, there's a bits and pieces. Um, I, I always show this up. Come and see us when the when this is over. Um, nothing beats being in the location. Ralston itself is a worthwhile destination. Um, beautiful little town. Like it's we're lucky. A gorgeous place. Absolutely gorgeous place. I would highly recommend. You I been? Know, I, I have to admit, I didn't know your winery was there, but I've camped in Duns. Oh, I've done. Yeah, Gangutty. We now call it Gangutty. We're going back to the indigenous name. Oh, no. Dun Swamp is a terrible name. And I remember sitting there with a, with, a, with a local, one oh, of the old school locals. I went, oh, what a terrible name for tourism. He said, it's a great name. It keeps the tourists away. I'm like, great. That's, that's, that's a positive. Um, but, but it's called Gangutty these days. And, and, and it's, it, you're, you would know it's almost a religious experience. You drive up and was it, we're right up in the mountains. Like the mountains around us are 1,100 metres and, they flooded this gorge system when they built Candos Cement, that was, which was Kajigong and uh, River. And so the river filled up to the cliff walls. It's not that big, but you know, it's a couple of hundred metres wide. And so they, you can hire kayaks and paddle boards and, and you paddle between you know, miniature you know, three gorges sort of dam system. And, um, and you get up there through this small windy road and the road gets to as, the cliffs get to as wide as a car. And you sort of drive through them and then it just opens up into this, I guess, incredible location. There's a lot of rock art up in the area up there, enormous indigenous um, history of the area, um, which is just fascinating. And you know, we're starting to come to terms with some of that. Um, I've always loved reading it. There was an amazing um, local Aboriginal war chief. They were called war chiefs. Um, they were not um, passive 
um, natives at all. And he was called Windradine. You should look him up. And um, when they captured him, they tried to capture him. They took six men to manhandle him to the ground. He was six foot tall. And apparently they caught, they caught, they, they, they caught him a Greek god. They were, he was a big, really big guy. And uh, he read, led one of the most successful um, insurgency campaigns um, against British rule in the empire, at that, even better than the Maoris. And, yeah, and it almost collapsed the whole Australian colony. Yes, so, yeah. pheno phenomenal. Go, he, he's a phenomenal, when you go and read him up, but he, you hear from him, he was, he was quite amazing in the area. And he, um, he, he was a, it explains the cycle of violence. It was a war. It was called the Frontier War. We just don't have Hollywood to write stories and make movies out of it. So mm -hmm. I feel that we would be better served if we told it because people might go, okay, I understand now maybe why you know, there's the cycle of violence was perpetuated, but also how nice it is to understand that they were, that they did fight hard for trying to keep it. It's, um, so anyway, wealth, worthwhile region, don't need to go into that discussion anymore, but, but beautiful region, amazing olive oil, good country pubs. John, you're English, you appreciate the fact that- a Very, good country, very good dumplings in Ralston too. Very good dumplings, but you appreciate that it's got a, a good village has got to have a good bloody pub and it's good. An amazing it's 1840s pub. I, I'm, I'm yeah. just agreeing with you vociferously. We loved Ralph. And when we oh, visited. thank you. Thanks, Michael. Well, you're welcome. They come back. So come and see us. Um, We're going to. We're going to visit the vineyard when we come back. <laughs> well, well get, get, get ready for a three kilometer driveway in. It's a big vineyard and you've got to drive through it all to get to, get to the cellar door. Um, if you do want to buy some wine, I know we're getting towards the end of lockdown, mm -hmm. but um, and obviously come to the cellar door is the best. If you need anything in the meantime, um, don't worry about the end 17th of September. That's a bit old. Um, but 20% uh, off anything that you're know, any mixed cases or above, just or email me. I'm happy to happy to look after you guys and um, and help you out. But otherwise, come and see us. As I said, the region, the tour, the, there's so much to see out our way. And it's not just us. You go to Orange, you go to Bathurst, you go to Dubbo, you do Western Plains Zoo, you go to Mudgee. Um, it's, it's, there's enough there for a week or two. So... I will just PDF this up five seconds and then uh, you can, I'll save it. You can then download it or email me and I'm happy to, to share it with you. But thank you very much for putting up with me for two and a quarter hours. Yeah, <laughs> very much. Thanks, Lou. You did way more Thanks. than you expected. That's the time. It's like Avatar. We really <laughs> enjoyed it. Great. This, this virtual masterclass was brought to you by David Cameron. You know, what's, what's the... What's the <laughs> James Cameron, James Cameron, you know, Titanic and Avatar, yeah. But thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you, Will. Oh, thank you very much. Apologies. Yeah. For Great education. Yeah, it's it's just to start. You find with Burgundy, the more you know, it just it just becomes this rabbit hole of 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 options that you've got to work your way around. So, yeah, oh. it's good fun. Oh, there we are. Sorry, there we are. I'll just post up now. Sorry, I was, it's PDF'd. Right, I should have PDF'd it before. Computer, date modified. There you go. Thanks, Rob. Oh, pleasure. Oh, Next time. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. It's, it's, just, it's just uploading, so you might need to finish it. Um, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Vince. I look forward to seeing you guys. These guys have an amazing wine bar in North Sydney, so you get the chance oh, to go there. Which one? Green Mustache. Oh, okay. I have to discover <laughs> it. I'm in North Sydney. <laughs> All right. Lovely. It's got a, it's up, you've got to go upstairs. It's in North Point. It's got an amazing atrium and a beautiful bar overlooking the area. And oh, uh, good people. That's probably, and, <laughs> and they've got Coravin, so the wine list is good. Trust me. <laughs> best, best, best wine list in North Sydney. That's absolutely, oh, I agree great. with that. <laughs> And, um, that was a lot of fun, Will. Take it from an academic. That was a masterclass. In very informative. As well as in, uh, as well as in vintnering. But, thanks, Michael. I, I, I appreciate it. I, 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 if I can out ac academic and academic, I, I yeah. I, I'm... Mate, you add academic <laughs> to me by about a thousand percent. Don't worry. Oh, never. Very interdisciplinary, as we say. <laughs> the it's in it's, geology, it's a... biology. <laughs> Chemistry. Chemistry, everything was very good. Thank you so much. Maybe, maybe, maybe they need to create a proper school. You know, like they have like the Ramsey School or whatever. We need to create like a, a wine school, which is a, a multidisciplinary. 
philosophy department, you know, because of why you, I'm you'll, be, you'll be lecturing at Charles Sturt before long, I'm sure. Oh, my God. You, you could <laughs> you do well in their veterinary course, I, I bet. Yeah, well, you know, wait. I've got to, I've got to find some spare time to a newborn, a three-year-old. <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I've got a two-year-old and another one on oh, the way. Uh -huh. Welcome back home, mate. Uh, I got to say, you know, you must, thank God you be back, but uh, with two-year-old as well. Thank you, grandparents. Is this helping you? You guys must be all of this living with the grandparents, parents. Grandparents are great, and, and English wine is good, but Australian wine is better. I don't know that. <laughs> John's like. We just. Uh, uh, I don't think we to make any claim to English wine. France is just around the corner. Correct. <laughs> uh, that's why you know. Let's be English honest. English sparkling. English sparkling. That's the stuff that's quite good. But